Hello, 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 hi. I hope you found a comfortable spot. Welcome to Casco. I'm Mariana. I'm part of the team here. We will start in five minutes. So I know you kind of find your positions and everything is tight, but if you need toilet, more coffee, now it's your time and then we start. Okay? Thank you very much. Uh, just for housekeeping, there's a toilet in the back, through the library in the back, and there's one upstairs as you go on the stairs to the right. Okay? Thanks.
Hello, yes, okay. Good to know that there was a little, <laughs> a little thingy. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I am Ivelisse, and I am here today to open a little bit the space for listening uh, from, a, I would dare to say, a, bo a, bo a bit more of an embodied uh, relationship to listening. But before I do that, I would like to introduce myself a little bit. I am, uh, I am born in a territory that is now called Bolivia, and I am half Brazilian. And I live in the Netherlands for about 20 years already. And I am a performance artist and a musician and other things <laughs> <laughs> among the conglomeration of my practices. And um, um, for a while already, um, through a mountain, I have been called back to ancestral knowledges of where I come from. And since then, I have been harvesting, but also been given a lot of practices. Uh, and for that, I am so grateful that I have been able to practice the ways of my grandmothers and my grandfathers and grand, grand, grand. Um, and I'm just back from there, so I feel a little bit, um, how do you say, liminal. <laughs> I am still a bit there and I'm still a bit here. Um, and I have, in this harvest and in these beautiful sharings I have had the luxury to be in, there was one uh, symposium or one practice where we were talking a lot about, um, well, they, we all, about sonority from the mountain and Andean point of view. And the sonority is really related to their ecosystem. So sounds are harvested from the invisible beings that inhabit that territory. And thus we are just the mediums to play these sounds in order to converse and have dialogues with the trees, the mountains, the seeds, and the also the cosmological, cosmic beings. Um, and there was this beautiful questioning happening in relation to sound um, that was, for who do you play? For who do you sing? And for who do you make silence? And uh, indeed, in the case of these lineages, they make sound and singing and silence for the inhabitants of their ecosystem. So it's an ecological way of making sound. And I thought I'd just harvest that and bring it here. I borrowed this way of thinking in terms of what we're gonna do today. So I think if I would translate it here, I would ask perhaps, for who do we think? For who do we talk? For who do we make silence, but also for who do we listen between us, no? Uh, with taking in account that we are within an ecology of our own bodily systems and group systems and the territory of the Netherlands. So <coughs> with that in mind, I would like to make a tiny little mini exercise together, if you're okay with it. Um, and uh, I would like to first uh, also mm, practice what this, this ancestral lineage taught me that is about permission. Like, <coughs> normally when we start um, a circle of talking, uh, in, in Bolivia at least, we bring this little textile, um, some of you are not going to be able to see it, maybe some yes or later on. And this textile is, um, first of all, um, uh, you could say an oracle kind of thing. So it's the, the woven patterns that are there are um, in inheriting, inheriting, 
<laughs> inherently intertwined with the ecology of things. So the trees are, are being woven, the plants are being woven, the animals of that territory. So I have been given this textile as a document of that place. So we always bring the tari, and inside the tari we bring um, coca leaves. I couldn't bring them because, as you all know, they are criminalized leaves in this uh, in the north part of the <laughs> of the planetary worlds. Um, uh, so, and normally what we do is not sit in a circle together, and then we open the tari, and then we start chewing this leaf, and then we start talking together to share and to listen, and and then we first take our time to chew, and then we sing a little bit together, and then we start talking and sharing. So Anna, thank you for inviting me. Joram also, uh, I'm gonna share this. It's a very simple exercise of asking permission to the ecology of this group, and the ecology of the beings that are in this group, and your own ecology, of course, and perhaps even, who knows, of the invisible beings that are here with us. Uh, if you are okay with it, with your permission, of course. And permission in this uh, kind of practice is not necessarily, oh, I'm gonna ask permission. It's because you already exist, you have the permission, but it's more about acknowledgement. Acknowledgement that we are gonna sit together listening to our sisters and brothers and beyond. Is that okay? Yes? Cool, then I'm gonna um, turn on the fire first, since we do not have coca leaves here. And then I am gonna ask the my, my grandmother line from my mother's side to be here with me. That is, the seeds are from Brazil that I got from people there. So I'm gonna <laughs> ask my grandmothers to be here with us. And this is a textile from Bolivia that I got that is from my grandmother line in the Andes. So we put it in the middle of our uh, body because um, this place is the one that unites the the world of the mind with the world of the body. So it's the bridge. That's why I put it here. Yeah? <coughs> so I'm gonna play a couple of shakers and little instruments just to help us all to enter into, um, to ask permission to our own listening to enter together to a, to a place together of listening. Okay, so if you wish, you can close your eyes. And it always helps when you breathe in and out three times, yeah? You can do this, you can also not do this if you want. Uh, it's no obligation, it's just a suggestion. And in this sense, we try to relax our bodies a little bit. And we ask permission, or better said, we acknowledge the beings in this space, our own body and mind, and we try to relax it a tiny little bit more to be enter a practice of presence.
Slowly we melt into a practice of our individuals and collective bodies together. <coughs> we enter in a um, proposal of listening. of thinking, of talking, of sharing the conglomeration of our ecologies from our territories. We embrace, if we want, if we wish, the communal intelligences that are intertwining in the space today. And we breathe in one more time. And out. And slowly the ones that are feeling a bit more relaxed or perhaps entering in this new state or old state or re revisited state, um, we can open our eyes. Thank you, and um, let's um, let's invite uh, Rosalba to start the conversation. Thank you very much for opening this uh, space and this moment of conversation. Um, my name is Rosalba Icaza, and I'm here as an scholar activist, a decolonial feminist. And it's really a, an honor. I'm humbled by this invitation by Anna and Joram to accompany uh, the conversation among amazing artists that we're going to be listening today. Uh, we have a couple of um, very exciting uh, moments during the day uh, between conversations, but also a film. And we will be guiding you um, in this process. But first of all, let me introduce a little bit of this uh, conversation. How is that one can heal from colonial wounds? From the erasure of voices, knowledges, sensations, and bodies destroyed by colonial rule? Can we resist monumental history and its force that inscribes oblivion in our bodies and spirits? Can our individual grief be healed through collective practices of mourning? Practices that are embodied, tactile, 
impermanent and generous, that center and growth from experiences of joy that togetherness bring with it. How can we keep remembering what is no more? How can we commemorate losses and in so doing retelling the story of who we were to understand who we are now and how we are moving together? And the monuments are speaking. We are coming to voice and body in, with, through them. As life-affirming practices, anti-monuments are enacting a struggle against oblivion and for life. These are forms of resistance to social struggles grounded in territories, fighting for climate justice, dignity and self-determination against ecological destruction. In our conversation today, we will know about four fantastic artists whose practices open the possibility to connect with place-based struggles in the Middle East, Aviala, and Africa. My hope is that at the end of the conversation, we will be able to see the threats of common struggles and create solidarity. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Ana Bravo Perez, Cristina Flores Pascoran, Anguesomo Mbabi Coro, and Nur Abed. Nur, unfortunately, is not with us today, but her work is. So I will introduce them, each of them, to you. Let me start with Nur. Nur Abed is a born Palestinian artist. Her work searches for the margins, for knowledge in the margins and marginalized stories. Those that have not been seen or talked about, in so doing, remembrance is an active practice from which the given is challenged. In a recent review on her work, I read that um, she tells stories of Palestine through its landscape centering Earth's agency that speaks to all of us. Rituality is central in her work too, as a form of mourning, but also as a form of resistance. Her interest on what remains opens questions regarding the presence of the past in the everyday. Han Nefkens said about her work the following, and I open quote. Nur Aved offers a poetic and multi-layered exploration of both personal and communal emotions around us, end of quote. It is my honor to bring Noor here with us, especially in these difficult and challenging moments. Let me now introduce Ana Bravo Perez. Ana was born in the city of Pasto in Aviala. Your work, Ana, word draws, sorry, your work draws on migration, memory, and violence. Your own migration and diasporic experiences are a starting point for your artistic projects that investigate suppressed narratives and collective histories. Anna, you are interested in ways of working that deals with violence, but that are not violent, that do not reproduce more violence. This is certainly one of the aims of decolonial feminisms. Your work in search of a deep connection with Earth connects 500 years of destruction of people's dignity under colonialism to consumers of earth, gifts, and sacred plants. Your work reveals that we are all affected by coloniality. Displacement as an effect of violence grounds your search for embodied memories. Madelon Van He describes your work as, and I open quote, one that unveils the unseen and that gives words to the unspoken, end of quote. In a nutshell, your work deals with the erasure of coloniality. Thank you, Anna, for sharing your work today with us. Engesomo and Babi Koro, your family roots are Wollen and Tem in Gabon. As a visual artist, curator, black feminist writer, lecturer, and ancestral healer, your work includes immersive installations, sonic radio, live art performances, 
archaeology, film, and archives. Your work explores Creolais identity, heritage, memory, and homeland, and investigates systems of colonial past and present, tyranny, the breaking of gender binaries, traditions, and mythologies. Your work retells stories of colonization as erasure of people's knowledges, ways of being in the world. As an anti-colonial archive, your performances reassembles what has been separated, split by coloniality. The Berlin Artistic Research Grant Program describes your work as one that, and I open quote, has developed frameworks of rituals and healing in performance work that often reveal the entangled colonial histories of migration, outside specific spaces to dismantle prejudices and organize accessible levels of consciousness through testimonial archives of local communities and to build independent emancipatory tools for liberation, education, consciousness, intimacy, and healing. End of quote. Thank you for being here with us. Cristina, Cristina Flores Pescoran, born in Lima, Peru. Your family is from the northern coast of Peru, from Trujillo and Piura. Piura. Your work includes drawing, engravings, ceramics, photography, video art, performance, and textile processes. Your work centers around the body, body movement, body beyond form, body ritual, body healing, a wounded body, cuerpo cicatriz, a body in place and place in its surroundings, a body that expands. Your artistic practice asks how to heal the body. And you share with us the kipu, the Inca knot, and the chancay to retell stories of healing. Gerson Ramirez describes your work, Woven World Worldview, as one that tells us how you, Cristina, seek to understand your body, for which you create a worldview that starts from your relationship with weaving, a technique linked to the concept of femininity. In so doing, you conceive your body as an ever-changing territory, always enigmatic, always alive. Thank you, Christina, for being here. And with these presentations, it's really my honor to pass to the first activity that we will have today. And it's by getting a sense of who these amazing artists are. And I will be, I will be giving first the floor to Christina. So Christina, please, if you can come forward. After that, Ana Bravo Perez will present. And after that, Angesomo and Becca Bicoro will present with us, okay? so. Please, Cristina. Yeah, perfect. Hola, hello everyone. My name is Cristina Flores Pescoran, and I'm going to read a poem that I wrote uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, it calls El Tiempo Según Emilia, Time According to Emilia. In the stories my father tells of his time as a churrito, churrito means a little chubby, child. My great-grandmother Emilia counted the time through her hair. Jueguen niños hasta que yo termine de peinarme, Emilia said. Her hair rippling undulated with each brushstroke, so long that it touched the ground. The churritos knew that when she finished rounding her hair, a time last had closed open it. The time, according to Emilia, Time and earth, counting the time with a hair. Symptoms. 
despigmentation, hyperpigmentation, symptoms in a brown body. At 16, 16 years old, my skin began to speak to me. Despigmentation, hyperpigmentation. The other day, I spoke on the phone with my father. It rained a lot last night. The water ran inside the house too. What will the rains be like in the north of the country? While he talked, I brushed my hair. Is it unusual for this time of rain to exist? He comments. Because in Lima, it never rains, I thought. We hug from a distance. And when I finish combing my hair, I fall asleep. In my dream, I move to hug him. Diagnosis. August 2018. Welcome to the sample collection C0209. Say that TV screen in the waiting room. False positive, error, false negative. Family health story. Every time I comb my hair, I see how long the, the times go by. Emilia, I find it curious how come I have a skin cancer and the tree that used to protect us from the sun is gone. The Algarrobo, tree of the dry forest from the north coast of the country, the Algarrobo that used to be in my grandmother's house has been disappearing. The plagues of the larve, the plagues of the man, the plagues of omission. I feel exposed. I got rubber body. Many doctors saw me. Many doctors saw me naked. They turned me into an object. How's, how has medical institution treated us? Our diverse bodies classificate, examine, exoticize, feminine bodies, brown bodies, surden bodies, dissident bodies, indigenous bodies, cholo body, our skin, our hair, our marks. Many doctors saw me, each time a new one. Don't touch my hair. Meanwhile, I keep counting the time. Meanwhile, they extract a piece of me, a piece of my skin, a biopsy, a piece of a skin that allows them to read me without looking to my eyes. Treatment. Abrir, romper, cortar, triturar, sazonar, sofreír, hervir, hornear, atamalar, remolver, desmenuzar. Probar, degustar, alinear y conversar. Our breasts keep the environment warm. Our hands touch what they call forbidden. Our mouth kiss the chili peppers while you and I beat our succulent bodies. Repair the fracture that exists in time, tied to the ancestors, hug and eat an algarrobina in our dreams. Come from the top to the bottom. Emilia, listen, I stopped cutting my hair. The medical space was always distant to me. Meanwhile, I brush my hair. Flowering. Cuerpo algodón, maíz, coca, payar, algarroba. Our territory has changed. The rain will be stronger and longer. And we will lose a few more algarrobos. Meanwhile, Emilia will remain eternal. She will make us dance while we see 
how her hair barely touched the sun on the ground, and some of it will fall, marking the time. The Algarrobo is being displaced. Our surface is changing. My skin is changing. Emilia and I will continue dancing, spinning and branding our hair. Emilia and time, a time lapse has closed, open it. Thanks. I'm gonna try. <laughs> wow. I wrote uh, some text. Also, I want. I don't wanna lose on the time. Um, so hello again. Um, I want to start with this image that we can see here on the wall. And it's a genital action, a protest, a scream. This image was made in August uh, 2015. And that year, uh, friends and I in Lima, Peru, uh, feminist collectives, we embraced each other in the streets of Lima uh, with our voices, bodies, music, fire. Because <laughs> um, we were in this, uh, in this period of, of the time of the moment, the Dejala Decidir. So it, that means let her decide movement for the, the discrimination of abortion in case of sexual rape. So this is an issue that we are still fighting in, in Peru. And uh, for me, this image was uh, the beginning of a series of uh, different actions that I made in public space. So, that night, we, in our diversity, uh, among the, the media, aggressors, the police, we took the public space um, for our girls, for our friends, sisters, mothers, and grandmothers. That night, I returned home with a flame of fire in my chest, remembering that in the morning I was afraid that fear represent fear of many years is like an irritance that I had to be stopped. And for how long, for, for a long time, it was so difficult for me to talk and even share my thoughts about things that were happening in my country. But in this case, um, I, could feel that my voice was joining to other voices. That it's not just only my body, that I can join in a hug and embrace another, another bodies. And so my body, I understood that could have different dimensions and I could extend myself and hug my sisters. And that night something changed. And that night we made an earthquake. We can go to the second. I'm gonna <laughs> move a little bit. Okay. Well, and about this picture, uh, it's a it's a collective uh, feminist uh, group that I made with a uh, one of my friends. Um, her name is uh, Cecilia Redman, and. It's kind of uh, curious because one day we decided to have a meeting, a, a reunion, a moment to share together. And we uh, started to talk about uh, how we feel in the public space. So it was a very casual conversation, but that turns into something more deep because 
for me, even now, it's like a revelation that many of us, we can share similar situations of aggression. So it's something that is happening there in, in Lima. So even if, if it's a cons very conservative, uh, um, in society also is very aggressive uh, with the people that don't look like the normality, you could say. So, so even if, when you are a, a woman and you're walking, you al always perceive these kind of things or different kind of aggression. So we start from there because there were some moments when we feel like fear. So we don't walk, we don't want to walk for that street. It looks dangerous. We, I feel exposed, I feel vulnerable. And starting from there, we decided, okay, we need, a mo we need something. We need to recover that power. We need to say with a loud voice that we are there and this is also our space and we can do whatever we want and they can't touch us. So we can continue with the, yeah. So this was the first action that we made. Um, this is a museum uh, and we started to, to start to webbing. Um, this action that for many people uh, in, that in that moment was considered as something very passive or uh, in, in, in it's, it's related to the intimacy of a space, we decided to took it out and in a moment also to reclaim for this space for us and, and also to heal how we feel with this, this uh, context because also they were in the context of, of violence also in the streets against to the government. So for us it was a really beautiful moment, just not talk, just starting to do an action that allow us to try to understand ourselves and understand how our body is connected with, with the space. This is the second action that we decided to do. Uh, this is in that new, new Una Menos uh, March. And since that year, we decided to, to recreate and to repeat that action in a way that also invite and have the opportunity to talk with people um, and join to, to our friends in this, uh, in this movement. We thought and we did these actions in that allow us to, to connect um, with the situation, what is happening? Because uh, we were doing this uh, specifically much for um, autonomy of our bodies and also reclaiming to the Congress that they need to uh, create or because what, what is happening in the government in Peru is just uh, something that it makes me sick. <laughs> and when we was trying to do this kind of action, it was a way how to also uh, scream and make it public and also share it with a lot of uh, our, our feminist friends that were there. And also we talk about memory, about what is this kind of aggression that was happening and there was still happening all the time. And you do? so we were not just only March. We were trying to go to places that they have this uh, aura of uh, political power. So we were there and we were trying to continue this action for a period of time to continue webbing. We still, in that moment, we weren't sure about what we were doing with our hands. The action was the, the reason of the, 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 the importance of all of this. And we took these pictures in the Justice Palace and also the police was closing all that part of this uh, space because there were also a lot of money, uh, uh, well, man, um, well, th this was a crowd of people. Well, we decided to just sit and we decided to continue with this action. And I think the power of webbing gave us the possibility that a lot of people could came to us and just sit 
and just talk. And I think in that moment of of angry and disappointed, we need it. Uh, this specific action where in the center historical of Lima, it was a uh, religious festivity. And, and we decided to go to these places because also West took it. And it was so difficult and dangerous also if you're a woman and you are alone. Because if you work also for this street, you have to be careful of all the people, well, men that are around you. So um, we can continue. So we went inside of the church. This was a, a, a church in, in, in Lima. S and yeah, it was in 2017. And we decided to sit and just continue with the wedding. And it was so beautiful that there were women, <laughs> that they were the ones that, that only who, who came with us. Um, so, because even there were another uh, people, but just only the women, they came with us and they were asking us just what we were do doing and also telling us uh, stories about also uh, how they connect or who teach them how to work with the textiles, with the threads. So it was also a really beautiful moment for us because we can not have the possibility to recover this affection with the place and, and see that the, the thread can open a conversation, it can open a relation with a person that probably is a stranger, but we are sisters in this kind of connection in this, uh, uh, in, in this place, but, but maybe it's not gonna be, um, it's not so common sometimes to talk. We can so we decided this, uh, this journey, this traveling for many parts of, of Lima and Peru. We went also to Cusco. Um, just we stayed there. Just we, we were a stand and we were opened this window to sharing. And I think this is something also that we were in, um, it was something f new for us because wh when we start this action, it was like a process, personal process to healing. But in the process, we understood that there are people that they uh, also need something, that someone there that can listen. And, and then you understand that, yeah, all of us, we are looking that because public space in Lima, because also my house is just five minutes from there. Um, it's a lot of violence. And in the night, it was so difficult to go outside. And, and there are parts of the streets that it's, uh, it was so complicated for me to walk alone. So be with a friend, it, rec it gives me that moment to recover for that, for that uh, experience. I want to share this another, um, another project, action, experience, moment of healing that I made to not alone, it starts as a collective experience. We make a reunion in a park with, uh, with a lot of uh, friends too. Um, so we start, it was in 2016. Uh, we were preparing a lot of things for the March, the Nuna Menos. Uh, we decided just with a small action, but it was so powerful because at least I decided to continue. It. And so it starts like a pin that I used to wear every day. I put it also in my chest when I had to go to different places, even parties, so to the market. So I, I was so proud to have it with me. Um, but in a central point, I decided to, to continue. It was, it was something very personal. That's the way how I started. We can continue with it. So every March, every uh, reunion that we did in the streets, I decided to let it grow. Um, in that moment, I was, um, I was having a medical condition. So I, when I was creating this, um, uh, this kind of textile in my chest, also I, I felt like I was protecting myself. And I was extract, I, I have the, this feeling that I was extracting someone from inside of my body. And it was like a reflection of all the words that I want to say. But sometimes, because sometimes in yelling uh, or, or do it with the join with your voice, sometimes it's really hard. So I want to put it on my chest and scream with my body. So this piece of body starts to grow with me. <laughs> yeah. So this was in the ending of 2017. I was um, 
I feel empowered. <laughs> In that moment, I feel empowered. I feel like I, I was uh, embracing part of my organs also were there just flowering with me. And this was, this was my recreation, could I say, of the Peruvian flag. But in the middle, I decided, OK, in the middle, I'm going to put this, um, uh, how you call it, um, escudo? Shield. Shield, yeah, this is the, the regular that you see in the flag. Yeah, but in this case, it was my uh, vivas nos queremos. So that was um, also reclaiming whatever is happening in the context of, of the women in, in, in Peru. So I decided to let it grow and be part of different manifestations. Um, and so every, every time it started to grow layer by layer. So it was like different levels, I think, of growing. And it took, uh, it took like, the, 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 it started to take, um, it's like, it's like a, a new body. It's not me anymore. It, or probably it is, but it's more than me. And I think it's, it's something that's, yeah, it protects me, but it's also uh, a part of, of the community, it's a it's a moment also to resistance that we can share. So I took this self portrait in 2021. We were in the middle of the uh, uh, pandemic, could say. Um, so the government was very um, restricted with uh, with the proximity. With um, I don't know. It's like it was it was a, a very difficult moment for us because. All these manifestations, the, all, all these actions are collective. Mm -hmm. We are part of a group. We are friends, feminists. We, we, we share the public space. In the parks, we talk, we have these meetings, we create performance actions, and, and now we had to be in our house, in our home, try to communicate with computers. And what happened is something it's important, what we can do, because uh, it's difficult for us to meet in person. So. Also part of the creation of the ma uh, of this uh, mask, it was part of that context. And, and I was taking pictures of me in a way also to share, because we were sharing pictures of us manifesting against of what, what is happening in Peru. So, because uh, also the, the, the COVID reflects this difference and discrimination that exists in, in the society. Yeah. So this was a... Um, uh, Se September 28, 2021, um, it's for the, it's about the, the it this, was, this was, was one of the manifestations that, um, that we were, many of us on the street, because it was so difficult for many months and even like a year. And so when we reunion this time, it was like a, a moment of fighting, a moment of, uh, celebration at the same time so we were took that moment and we decided to create a lot of music and dance we took the place and we tried to be there for as long as we could <laughs> um, so there were music and this uh, performative uh, present start so when I always have this um, um, this between costume body takes all in my body it's like I feel like I have the power and also I have this long braid that came from my from this part of the textile and also there is a very typical um, character in, in the Peruvian uh, history that went whip the person who who is um, it's a bad politician that he had always it's like he likes to uh, it's like a hero. <laughs> so in this time, it's like, oh no, I am the hero now. I'm, I'm the woman, I want to just fight. So I always move my braid to in the streets and I like to beat <laughs> with all the people that are around me. Well, well some of them, <laughs> not all. <laughs> but I, I just started to feel so, with so much power. And I recognized myself like, yeah, this is what I need. Because for many years I was so shy. And even on the streets, I'm like, if something happens, even if, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be conscious of, okay, I need to be sh secure all the time, but if something happens, sometimes it's like, I don't know how I'm going to react. But in this case, when I have this, um, you know, this new costume, I feel like I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and I can defend myself, and I can defend my sisters, my friends are there. Uh, I don't feel, I'm, I'm a hero, and I'm going to use each part of me to defend the people that I love. 
So this is our another continuous of images of this uh, textile uh, part of the Central Historical of Lima. And this action continues for months and days. So this picture was took in 2022. So as uh, you see, it was mandatory to use the mask. So every time, yeah, all the time, all the time. Uh, you, you have to use mask if you want, to the, if you want to go to the pharmacy, if you want to go to the market, if you want to go to the church, or even just walking on the street, every time, just the mask. So I decided to stand up in different parts also and just stay there. And it's so powerful how the people just is stand with you. And even it's like a secret sometimes, like, a, yeah, I'm with, I'm with you, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, what you're doing is so powerful. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. It's like, you can feel it. You can feel it there. And so this kind of actions took me, I, I, I don't, uh, I didn't, I don't have, um, I'm not sure about the time, but yeah, the idea was just stay there, stay there for them and, and just receive, receive that, uh, also that, that affection. And also there are sometimes aggressive comments too, but I decided to, I'm not, I want to, <laughs> not this time, no. I'm here, I'm this woman, and if you say something, no, thank you, no. <laughs> I'm just for my friends and the people who need it. And that's uh, what it, it makes me feel focused and the reason what I'm doing, what I'm doing. Yeah, so this was also in front of the church and there were also a lot of tourists around. And it was curious, because with my friend, um, he was um, always, when I'm doing these actions, uh, I have a friend that is, uh, makes me feel also secure because you don't know how, how it's gonna happen in the public space, even in there, because also the police could be violent too. Uh, so when he was talking me the a photo, um, a guy came and just he stand between he and me, just there. And I wasn't, uh, I just, I just, just figure out when I was also checking the, the photos that, that, I, that I have, that he was there and he was also looking the camera and, and he knew that they were look, they were, he was taking me photos. So he just stand there in between us, just, uh, it, try, it, it was like a silent fight. <laughs> I saw it in that way. Yeah. So now when I see the pictures, now I, I'm like, I'm reading also this, what, what happened. Because also that's another thing that I, uh, um, that I now understand that there was like a moment when you do it with your own body. And there is another moment when you see all the memory of the things that happened in that moment. And you can also see you from a different place. And you also can see what happened in the context. Some, some uh, 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 another details that you were aware when in the moment you, when you were doing it. Mm. And this picture was taken in 19, 20, 29 July, so it was Independence Day. <laughs> so it was forbidden to take manifest to do a manifestation here to the near to the palace. It's not um, so the police was around there that place. So it was really uh, fun. Uh, I, could, I don't know because uh, I was with my friend and I was covered with a coat and goes yeah let's go because the police they block different parts. So you it's, it was it, you weren't allowed to to manifest it then. So. For that day, they decided to open, open this main square for the public, tourists. So I was like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so we did this very fast, or at least um, try to check where is the police. So I run to the center of, of, this, uh, of the, president, the government, so the president probably was there. And I decided to just stand there. Um, I was trying to count you know, the, the, the time, but it was a moment that nothing was happening. Um, so. We, we decided to repeat it again because uh, we had time. So there were a moment when we saw people just walking and, and that was the, okay, just we need to go very fast because we don't want to take the risk like to have problems with, that, with the police. And in that moment, because it was difficult, I was um, also in the middle of the treatment. So when I see the first picture of the presentation, I see, oh, for me in that moment, I was like, I can, I can, work and fight with my body. But n in this year, that was last year, I was really feeling like I just, I just also need to um, take care of my energy. So we wanna take that pictures and just, and, and then we're gonna continue. We are resistant and, but also we need to take care of, of our bodies. So that was also important for us. And well, so this is the last one. I don't know how it's going to be. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, so this is the last um, action, uh, a series of uh, last material action that I made is all women, uh, mujer búho. Uh, um, so this kind of action is start uh, with the process uh, to recreate this flag, this Peruvian flag. 
um, all this action was in the context of the political elections where Castillo and Keiko Fujimori, uh, Keiko is the dictator's daughter, uh, were there in the last uh, round. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, uh, people that were asking about, okay, um, the feminists, the feminists, um, what is your decision? It was not a simple decision because um, we have uh, in that moment a Keiko and his father, then he don't recognize the crimes and, uh, and how also destroyed the life of many women. And for the other hand, we have we had uh, Castillo and Castillo was, was <laughs> so, well, no, no, it's, um, uh, it, well, it was, it was very difficult because also the, the a, a plan for, uh, and also um, it was no, uh, it was empty, <laughs> you could say, because it, was, it wasn't, uh, he wasn't um, focused on, on anything. And um, so it was very difficult um, for us because we were trying to understand our context in the direction of the country. Um, so I decided to create this kind of, this action, uh, this performance also in public space. Could you? Uh, it was a lonely uh, march in this uh, period of time. Um, yeah, this was in, the, in July, 21, Ju June, July, April, April. Uh, it was difficult to go on the streets. Uh, even when I called my friends to do an action, they were a lot of fear. And there were friends that they feel sick or even emotionally it was so uh, difficult because, um, I don't know, they, they say that you have the immune system low also you have to or you have a medical treatment or uh, if you have the kind of risk in your health you have to take care of yourself so also in that moment i was uh, not sure to have a collective action but at least i called some of my friends but it was the, it was the same so i decided to do a walk uh just me and try to walk in the and visit and go to the places that i'm used to go with with a collective uh, with the feminist groups um, but this time it was just only me, so it feels so sad in, in a way because I, I wasn't in a group anymore. And, but I decided to do it in the, like a memory also for all the, the things that we, uh, we have been doing all this time. And so I start to walk from my house to the, to the center of Lima. And so this is all, uh, the market. And in the back it says, uh, women, dissidents, we are uh, watching. A fight in resistance. Um, so I decided to continue walk, and it was uh, the regular. It took me like uh, twenty minutes, twenty minutes. Uh, but this time it took me more. I decided to just stand just for a few minutes in different stops, and just walking there and try to have this kind of dialogue conversation with uh, this space that now it looks so distant to me. All of us we are uh, wearing masks, and it was a uh, fear. Uh, it w it in the context, you can feel it there. So now that people don't want to stay close to me, they try to avoid me, and I was trying to, okay, what can I do? How can I connect uh, again with this place um, that used to be mine? Or at least I thought in that moment. So, um, yeah, I was taking my flag with me, just I was standing there in different corners, and I took this picture where uh, Isidro Lambari, that is also a, ver a very good friend, he took this picture, also the, uh, the palace is there, but now we have all these uh, bars, so it was difficult to get there, and I was trying to, f to find a place, but I couldn't, so I was walking around, walking around, watching, and also trying to see on the eyes to the other person, and always distance, the people don't make this kind of distance with me. Thanks. So I went also to the uh, Justice Palace. We used to have these collective groups and music, and but now it was just only me again. Um, I decided to uh, stay there, well, so as much as I could. So it was very kind of weird, because um, the police saw me, but they didn't, they didn't do anything. <laughs> 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 yeah, yes, yeah, so I was like, okay, nobody wants to stay, just, just are next to me, so fine. Uh, so I went to, I was continuing to walk in just back to home, kind of um, with this mysterious uh, energy around. All the people with this plastic also mask, because it was so common there, and double mask, double uh, this fabric mask, and also this, uh, this plastic one. So um, this, um, this symbolic of the costume, this, this mask that, that I'm wearing, I made that one with copper and also uh, 
cochinilla and wool llama wool. Um, is a representation of this uh, wool. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And in the Mochica culture, this uh, this animal is kind of that they that the deity, deity yeah, because it represents the union of the world of the dead people and also this world, the present. So I decided to create it uh, as a way that I want to connect with all the people that suffer. Uh, suffer with this also coloniality idea, this power uh, system that is there, all the discrimination to our identities, to our traditions, to also um, these religious groups that are there, and they, um, they, they are aggressive with us, and they invisibly us <laughs> too. So I, I see the necessity of me to recover that idea to, okay, talk to our ancestors, talk to the people who die, and they were never recognized their power, they never recognize us as a people. And also a lot of uh, women that die because um, also the medical system and the government and there are many laws that don't help them. So it was important for me to to manifest, do this manifestation and put it on the streets. Um, and also it was like a declaration, like it doesn't matter who's gonna win. Well, at the end Castillo wins, but well now he's not the president anymore. That's another story. But <laughs> even if in that moment we don't know who's gonna win, we need to be there, we need to watch. We're gonna be there, stand for each other, because this is not gonna be simple. I am very sure that it's gonna take a lot, many years and a lot of battles, but we need to do that, be there for us. I think this is the last one, yeah. And well, this is the last picture. When the peace agreement was signed, this started to happening. So there was a, a, a lot of stress among the people that uh, Colombia that have been living uh, uh, in Europe for many years. So we can go to the next. So yeah, here we can see, well, there you can see that also the names have been written by different people. Um, and then I was really, I, yeah, I was so touched by this uh, textile to see like it was so long and to see all these names, not to think about who took the time to write all these names by hand. Um, so I started uh, searching for who did, who made this, who made this, and I found out that it was a group of uh, women uh, that were living in Paris uh, that were felt so powerless because of, of, of this situation that was happening when we thought there was finally kind of like a peace uh, uh, um, yeah, atmosphere or a new stage starting uh, in the country, but on the contrary, this is what was happening. Uh, many of these social leaders uh, were uh, opposing uh, different uh, uh, so-called development projects that are uh, brought by multinationals that are coming uh, to do oil explorations, uh, oil extraction, uh, gold mining, copper mining, silver mining, and different kind of extractive industries. Uh, so what happened also, to give a bit of the context of uh, how this have happened, is because uh, paradoxically, they, while the guerrilla was active, they were present in many territories where uh, the guerrilla was opposing all the time the, the presence of multinationals. So in a way, they were protecting the territories from extractive industries. So by the time that this peace agreement is done, so then, of course, it's kind of like free territory, free, empty. empty. So multinationals can arrive, but the reality is that there are people living there. And there uh, this started in a way uh, to make visible how um, rooted people are in their territories, because the people since then have been saying, we want the gold in the ground. We want the oil in the ground. They are opposing mining, besides the discourse that this will bring development, progress, money, no? So, uh, be, and because of these reasons, well, we have facing this, at this moment, there are more than 1,000 social leaders that have been killed in the country. If we go to the next one. So after that uh, uh, demonstration, I start, because I was already based in the Netherlands, I start following up the different demonstrations that were organized uh, here. Uh, this was in 2020. Uh, another demonstration made in front of the International Criminal Court. And I also found interesting how there is a direct uh, 
in a way question or, or, or demand address to international organisms. No? Like here we can read in the center, this, there is this banner which says, Uribe, we are waiting for you at the International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. So this is a Colombian diaspora saying to Uribe, it was an ex-president in the country, right wing, uh, and during his government there were many massacres, but nowadays there is research that shows that it was an agreement between the army and non-legal uh, yeah, uh, army troops. So the next one uh, is another demonstration in 2021, uh, while in both of them during COVID, as you can see for the mask. Uh, this was another protest demonstration organized uh, in Amsterdam. And again, uh, you can, well, as you can read, no, there, was, there are these demands that are made by the Colombians living here about uh, demands, and I think also it's like a denounce no, of what is going on uh, there in the country. We can continue. Well, and after all of these uh, experiences of myself living in the Netherlands and meeting with this also group of bodies, I, well, I realized that I'm part of this diaspora. No? I'm part of this diaspora living here in the Netherlands. And also I felt the responsibility in a way like, well, now I'm, I'm super safe here. I'm in, a bear, in, a, in the comfort zone. I'm not experiencing the violence anymore, but my people, yes, they still are facing that every day. Mm -hmm. So I start really feeling the need that uh, I need to do something with it. I need to do something with it. And there was a moment that also I found, well, we can maybe go to the next one. So Minga is, Minga is another Kichwa word. Um, and here we can see the picture there is my great grandmother that used to be a weaver. She used to make uh, ruanas of ponchos similar to this. Um, and then um, it reminded me in a way that, that while this, when this was happening, I was really trying to find also the strength because there are moments that are difficult, like how to deal. You are there, but you are also here, but you are not there, but also like I'm not here, no? So it was very difficult moments. So um, I decided to start thinking about what to do and how to uh, connect with ancestral knowledges. So Minga uh, is, um, uh, well, what it means is to work collectively for a common cause. And normally when you organize a Minga, it's like you work together with more people and at the end you have like a feast, no? So you, you drink, you eat, you, in a way it's like a moment of celebration because you have been working together for a common cause. Uh, so if we move to the next one. So having this in mind, uh, we started organizing um, uh, different uh, mingas uh, to uh, invite people uh, to make a homage, a commemoration to uh, some of these land defenders that have been killed. I wanted to focus on women. If we go to the next one. Uh, because uh, They, because, well, women have been, um, everybody, women, men, queer, non-binary people have been affected by the violence. But in a way, women have been playing a very important role uh, in the communities uh, for, in terms of resilience. And for me, that was very important also to acknowledge and to recognize that uh, this is still happening, the violence is there, but also there is people which is so strong that is really trying to hold the communities alive and to maintain hope alive. So um, that's why I thought, well, I, we're going to start uh, giving this homage and commemoration to women that have been uh, doing this very important role in their communities. So the first Mimga was called Healing Colors. Um, and for this one, I invited uh, Lucila Kenny, uh, which is a uh, um, textile designer and specialized in uh, uh, natural dyeing. So with Lucilla, uh, we, are, we uh, set up like, okay, let's work with plants. And uh, we wanted to work with plants that are coming from Avia Yala because it was a way to connect with the territories, but also to connect with ancestral knowledges that have been passed on through oral tradition, but that nowadays you can find it in books and recipes. 
Uh, but uh, well, so that's what, if we go to the next one, that's how we decided among the colors, uh, thinking about the plants that are coming from different territories like Mexico, Brazil, but also Colombia and Novia Yala. Uh, and for this, uh, it was an open call. Who wants to join to make this homage to women? And the first step, it was to bring some colors to these plants to connect with our territories, to connect with memory, personal memories, but also to connect with collective memories. And to, and in a way for me, which is part of the, of the healing practice, is to, is to acknowledge knowledges that have been stolen. Because sometimes we think that everything has been erased, but not all has been erased. There are many knowledges that have been claimed by the West but are, are there, no? And I think it's also thanks to oral tradition that we can also claim certain knowledges that are still alive. Uh, then the next minga was embroidering for our sisters. And embroidering for our sisters, the intention was to, um, okay, we bring some colors to the textiles, and then uh, uh, we are gonna embroider uh, the names of these women that we want to homage. Um, so it was, again, an open call, like an open invitation, who wants to join us embroidering these names. And so we have different sessions uh, in, uh, in Amster, no, here in Utrecht at Casco, actually, and also we have uh, another, I'm going to check the time, okay. And then uh, another in Rotterdam, because the idea was also to give the possibility for people that live in different parts of the Netherlands to join, because during the first Minga, we received some messages, which was very nice, of people that was very interested, but they said, oh, but I live, you know, like somewhere else there, it's too far in Amsterdam, would be nice if it were somewhere else. So then we thought, okay, so then we organized it in, in Rotterdam. Also, so more people came and joined. And what was very interesting of these mingas is to see uh, the different, yeah, it was a diverse group. So there it was an intergenerational uh, gathering where women of different ages, non-binary, queer people could join, talk, and share. Um, and the idea with also this minga was to create a safe space for sharing, no? for sharing uh, stories. And for me, that was very meaningful. And for, I think, all the participants that we were there, because that was the, we were always open in the space. And then we have like a closure. And we were sharing personal stories, very personal stories. And it was beautiful to feel how everybody felt so safe to share. And so it was also so yeah, beautiful to see how uh, we were caring of each other, even though at the beginning of the Mingas, many were kind of strangers, but then it became really this part of sharing and recognizing that we are also part of, of a community, you know? Or, or we were kind of creating also another community. So that was beautiful. The next, um, so yeah, this was another session of the embroidering and in the photos there, I think we were very happy. That was the first um, textile that was finished. It was the first name that was embroidered uh, well, that was uh, finished with embroidering. And what was also interesting to do, that it was that um, uh, these uh, textiles, uh, it were, they were passed on through different hands, no? Because the idea was like, it's not just one person doing it, but that in, if in one session, one person comes, but she cannot come to the next session, so somebody else can continue doing the, the, the work in a way, because it was about that, sharing the experience and sharing this. A offering of time also for this commemoration. The next, uh, uh, yeah, and the la this was the last minga that we organized that is called Bodily Remembering. And uh, with this minga, we wanted to, um, yeah, to bring uh, memories uh, and memories of, and also to create the space for healing transgenerational traumas because that is also something that uh, uh, many of us in the different mingas we were sharing, that there is, it's not just our life experiences, but it's also the experiences that we have inherited. So through working with our bodies, we could manifest some 
feelings and some pains and some wounds that are there and that sometimes also we're not even very conscious but our bodies remember or show what is there. So for this uh, Minga, uh, we were working with uh, uh, Flavia Pinheiro, a uh, performer, artist and choreographer from Brazil. And what we did with Flavia was to organize in every session we were doing different exercises uh, in a way to let, the ba to let our bodies guide us, to, to let our bodies tell us. No? Like sometimes also we, this kind of that we don't want to listen to our bodies. Or we are so much in our heads that we don't listen to our bodies. So we did different exercises in a way to connect with our bodies, to be grounded and to yeah, uh, experience uh, different memories that we have and that we have embodied. Uh, so we have uh, six different sessions and this was as a preparation to do a collective performance, ritual performance in front of the International Criminal Court. Um, and this was also in a way uh, we were thinking about this as a moment of all of us. There were people that were participating in all the mingas, since in Healing Colors, in the Embroidery one, and also in this one. So uh, for some of them, it was like also the moment, like, oh, wow, we are almost close to, to what we wanted, which was to do this ritual performance in, in the International Criminal Court. And it was, uh, uh, I was thinking uh, also about the very connected with what Christina says, which is to claim a public a space, no? But what do you do when you are a migrant, <laughs> no? And you are in a territory that somehow you cannot claim that it's yours because it's like you are in this kind of liminal position that is like, wow, I'm not from here, but I live here, but I'm kind of part of, no? So it was a very important moment for all of us to, to, to claim a space that in a way we also found out that it actually doesn't really belong even to the Netherlands because it's like the International Criminal Court is in a ground that is kind of neutral. So it's like, oh wow, so oh. we are part of. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, very uh, important for all of us that were you know, in this process to, to also get to know this, not to get to this information because we wanted to film this performance. Uh, to document it and then we need to ask for permission no? and then to get to know also like what, uh, what it takes and what do you need in order to be able to go to this place to, to do such an, such an action. Um, uh, with bodily remembering it was also a, a, it was a great experience uh, to, to feel that uh, we were creating together. So it was a collective creation no? that there was Flavia was kind of leading us the group, but there was everybody was contributing and having ideas, and this was embraced. So it was a collective creation of what we did at the International Criminal Court. All this process was filmed, and then we brought all this star. We con the weaving continued, and then uh, we have uh, well now here in the upper floor we we can find if we remain silent. Uh, which is a weaving of multiple collaborations and is uh, my proposal for a feminist decolonial anti-monument. So if we go to the next. So this uh, um, proposal also is driven and inspired by the work of uh, Cristina Bautista Taquinas, an indigenous leader from the NASA people that is one of the um, the strongest indigenous movement uh, in Colombia that have been claiming, claiming and fighting, or they said that their struggle is for the liberation of Mother Earth. So it's not just about their recovering the land, but it's to liberate Mother Earth because Mother Earth has been enslaved since coloni the colonization process started. Uh, so Cristina Bautista Taquinas was a leader in her community, advocated uh, for the rights of women, children, and the self-determination of her community, which are the NASA's. Uh, she was uh, killed in a um, few weeks before she was killed in a public speech uh, with her community. She said, uh, if we speak up, we are killed. If we remain silent, we are also killed. So we speak. 
And when I read this story and to know that a few weeks after she was killed, it was like, <sighs> wow, no, what, what a courage. Um, but also what a, yeah, for me it was so clear that this has been the struggle and that is also how uh, you feel it uh, because I felt that, that this goes beyond individuals' needs or claims. It's, it's really a collective struggle and it is through working together that, that also, that's, uh, yeah, what for me that has been my experience and what I think we also need to do it together. We are deeply bonded, affected. We have been, uh, yeah, uh, experiencing violence on different levels. And the only way to deal with this is to do it collectively in group. And that has been part of the proposal also of these different mingas that are spaces for collective healing and for being together and also to remember that by sharing and being together, we are uh, stronger, no? And as I also saw uh, how uh, Christine explained it so well, how also you feel empowered because you feel that it's not just you and that also you know that you're connected with others and that because it then you know that it's not, it's not just your struggle, it's our struggle and, and we can do it together. Maybe if you are just alone, you feel that oh, it's, it's too much, it's too big, it's David against Goliath, but then if you feel that, well, it's not just you, we are many and we are in different territories. So, well, that was, uh, then we installed these textiles here. Uh, uh, so, if we remain silent, it's composed of four installations. One is Weavings of Resistance, which is a textile installation. We can go to the next one. That honors in these different uh, women. Uh, Virginia Silva, for example, was a traditional healer, also from the NASA people, same region, same people than uh, Cristina Bautista Taquina, Taquinas. But Virginia si Silva so w was not just a social leader, she was a traditional healer. And for me, this is something that uh, is also so important to, to, yeah, to talk about it and to think about it together because uh, this killing of, of traditional healers is again an epistemicide. Traditional healers are the women, the people that know so well what is on their territories, what is on their localities. They are the ones that have been holding and also also taking care of knowledges that have been passing on through generations via oral tradition. Uh, so Virginia Silva uh, was 70 years old when she was killed. And if you think about why, no, I mean, why a woman of 71 years old would be a threat for whom? But why? Uh, we can go to the next one. Uh, another installation is Our Bodies, Our Territories. Uh, it's a film installation analog film installation because my practice uh, is mainly or it has been developing mainly with a film or through film or in and through film. Um, and uh, well, with our bodies, our territories, I wanted, uh, we are showing a part of the performance we did at the International Criminal Court, but also I wanted to bring the territories kind of physically. So. The screen where the film is projected is, uh, uh, is a weaved screen uh, in Paja Toquilla, which is a uh, Toquilla straw, I think is the translation. Um, and um, for me, this also is, is a piece of work that it was made in collaboration with a cooperative, actually, with a, a women cooperative from my region. Um, and for me, this shows also another way of resistance, which is how knowledges have been maintained because uh, the women that are weaving uh, this uh, with, wi with this material, uh, which is this tokija straw, they know how to uh, plant this plant, how to harvest it, and how to treat it to be able to work with it. Because it's not like you just cut it and then you can use it. No, it has a whole process. And so this is also a knowledge that has been resisting and that has been maintained and passed on through different generations because this is a pre-colonial technique and knowledge that is still is alive. The next, and then also what I wanted to do is that uh, what the film is projected on this screen, but there is the creation of, new, of a new image because there is this 
image projected, but uh, with the texture of the, of the textile because there are different patterns that are there on the weaving. So there is a new image that is created if you look at carefully to the details, yeah. The next one, uh, then there is another analog film installation in another room that is called Presente, uh, where the sound was also very important uh, to bring the sound and to bring the voices because even though the uh, proposal for this feminist uh, decolonial uh, anti-monument is if we remain silent, is all about speaking up and it's all about talking, sharing. Uh, and the, well, this is a detail of the film screen and the next one. And there are also some details about the analog film installation. So even uh, stones have been helping us uh, on the, on the uh, installing this work. So this was also a, a challenge uh, to, to have this film. Uh, that film is not just, uh, in a way for me, it is uh, uh, how to bring film to the space, but also thinking from a decolonial perspective, because this format in particular, 60 millimeters, uh, cinema has been used uh, as a tool for colonization also, no? Uh, and I'm aware of that. So how to question this, how to question that, and for me to bring this is to open up the uh, cinema apparatus, but also this format, 16 millimeters in particular, was used a lot by anthropologists that were going to just film without asking any permission, bringing here and then uh, start talking and showing about people that after having brief encounters, they thought they were experts, no? So for me, it's also a way to, uh, another way of healing, no? It's like now we're claiming also these tools and we're using it in a different, in a different way. If we go to the next one, and this is also the proposal that film is here is telling you a story, not just for the images that you can see, but it's also how there is an extra layer that is, I don't know if you go before, <laughs> an extra layer that is uh, how the, the, the celluloid is showing us another layer of this story in which we are all implicated, I think. The loss of land defenders is not just a loss, uh, for Aviala or for the territories where this is happening. It's a loss for all of us because these people have been defending mountains, rivers. Um, if we go to the next one. Well, Carmen Ofelia Cumbalaza was another traditional healer, also from my territories, from Cumbal, Nariño, southwest of Colombia. Um, and uh, as I said before, Virginia Silva, Cristina Bautista Taquinas, uh, Carmen Ofelia Cumbalaza, and then we go to the next one. Uh, Adelinda Gomez Gaviria, Lady Viviana Trompeta, Magdalena Cocubana, Ana Lucia Bisbicus, Aida Conchabelan, Oneida Argenis Yatacue, Marianelli Cuetia Dagua, Ilia Pilcue Yule, Sandra Liliana Peño Chocue, Beatriz Elena Cano Uribe, Maria Ofelia Garcia, Carlota Isabel Salinas Perez, Yolanda Maturana Bonilla. They were defending mountains, rivers, trees, jungles, forests uh, that are crucial for the survival of all of us. So that's what I wanted to share today with you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. As you can see, the threads are coming and are started to be weave together with these two amazing presentations. But now it's my honor to present Ange Somo. <laughs> uh, please, you take the floor now, and um, I'm sure that it will be brilliant. Please.
we'd like to propose five minute break. Yeah.
Okay, so we are coming back. Um, yeah, as you saw, the program is a little bit delayed, so we're going to go through the flow. And I think that this is in very consistent with what we have been just listening and receiving. Uh, but anyway, now we will have the presentation of Ange Somo, which is, um, I'm very honored to um, call her name and, and, and for her to share her practice. And after that, we're going to have a longer break of 10 minutes to digest everything, to really connect back to everything that we have been listening to. And then we will have our first round of conversations in which you, of course, will be invited to uh, present your questions, among other things, uh, with the three artists that we are listening to. So please, Ange Somo. Thank you. Sometimes I wonder what to say to you now in the soft afternoon air as you hold us all in a single death. I say, where is your fire? I say, where is your fire? You got to find it and pass it on. You got to find it and pass it on from you to me, from me to her, from her to him, from the son to the father, from the brother to the sister, from the daughter to the mother, from the mother to the child. I say, where is your fire? I say, where is your fire? Can't you smell it coming out of our past? The fire of living, not dying. The fire of loving, not killing. The fire of blackness, not gangster shadows. Where is our beautiful fire that gave light to the world? The fire of pyramids. The fire that burned through the holes of slave ships and made us breathe. The fire that made guts into chitlins. The fire that took rhythms and made jazz. The fire of sit-ins and marches that made us jump boundaries and barriers. The fire that took street talk and sounds and made writers in hope tech raps. Where is your fire? The torch of life full of Nzinga and Nat Turner and Garvey and Du Bois and Fanny Lou Hamer and Martin and Malcolm and Mandela. Sister, sister, brother, 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 come, 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 catch your fire, don't kill, hold your fire, don't kill, learn your fire, don't kill, be the fire, don't kill, catch the fire, and burn with eyes that see our souls walking, singing, yeah, building, mm -hmm, laughing, <laughs> learning, yes, loving, yes, teaching, mm -hmm, being, hey, 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 young, young, young brother, hey, 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 young, 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 young sister, here is my hand, catch the fire and live, 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 uh, thank you both for your presentation, you also for this ritual. I think it's really important to have this. Okay, is it okay to leave the window, the door a little bit open? Thank you so much. Yes, um, and i just going to give you an introduction of a chapter of the work that I'm doing, um, because it's been 20 years now and it's a lot to say, but I don't have so much time, so we can uh, have this conversation together later on. Uh, I just wanted to share a poem by Sonia Sanchez that you just heard, which is, Where is your fire? This is some, um, it's a work that accompanies me a lot uh, in what I do, and sometimes appears in, uh, in my performances, uh, but it's also in the way that's for me where the work of mourning um, starts to, to be triggered. So uh, the story where 
stories always begins a bit ambiguously, but for me it's always it starts with death. Death has to belongs to a beginning and not to an end. Um, and the practice of death in the work is based on rituals called obeya. Uh, obeya are very specific uh, black feminist rituals from West Africa, um, from different coastal regions uh, that have been very much part of my family's culture. And during the slave trade, it was really important in the regions in Latin America, notably in Brazil and the Caribbean. Uh, and at some point, it was there to protect persons during uh, slavery, uh, but it was outlawed by the British. So when you, if, if you ever hear of Obeya, especially in Jamaica, they will say, no, 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 we don't talk about that here. It's a bad practice, but it's not. It's a practice of what, what they say in Cachoeira in Brazil, la boa morte. So it's the good death. It's supposed to be about healing, protection, regeneration, resilience, resistance, and it is a feminist practice. It's also practiced by men, uh, but the way that it uses ancestry and plant history in order to uh, carve forms of geographies uh, and ecosystems of safety and of remembrance. Um, I wanted to start with this image because I think that's gonna come up in the conversation later. Um, my work is not specifically looking at the um, at my home country in Gabon. It's a very um, oppressive system, like in most spaces. But in order to learn where I came from, I had to go out. Um, so often uh, we don't understand our own identities or our own voices or where we come from unless we start to go out and. What made me go out of my own home and finding new homes was illness, was death. Um, it was, a, it, maybe it's chronic, I don't know, but it always seems that with illness comes the change of movement, the change of geographies, the change of home. But therefore, I had uh, immense privilege, intimacies, and generosities of people, persons that I got to know that invited me into their homes. And it's about understanding their, their stories and their ancestries. And one of the places was in Mexico, uh, in a place called Norogachi, uh, in the north of uh, Chihuahua, um, where uh, I spent a lot of time with uh, women in the community. It was a time where I had just lost a baby, um, and that community was there to create circles of uh, protection and of healing. Um, one of the, uh, the in that village in Norogachi, um, it's mostly the Ramuri tribe. And every April, every year, there is a consistent ritual that happens for a whole week, day and night. Mostly the men perform it, but it's actually the women behind it that engineer it and also perform it and have to keep the men alive because you're not supposed to fall asleep. So there's a lot of and um, different types of plants or narcotics used, but your whole body goes into a trance. And of course, um, during those days, you will see bodies scattered around the landscapes in the desert uh, until the end. Um, and often the women would engineer like platforms or pockets of resistance. In that region, you will see every time you come back every year, people disappear. So especially in those um, regions where there's a lot of segregation, there's a lot of isolation also. You have different types of mafias, especially from the United States, that come and kidnap people for illegal industries and then they never return. So they take the men first, then they take the young boys, then they take the women. And in that space, usually the women are kidnapped, they're raped, and the perpetrators make money through this by filming those events um, and selling the footage. And once a woman goes through this, normally, basically, there's not a funeral. The funerals are not allowed uh, to happen in that region because if you speak up about it, if you perform this remembering for these women, you will get killed by uh, these American mafias. So this was one of the forms that we created to remember the women if they were not allowed to make public funerals or the women's bodies were not allowed to be buried 
by their own families. So we taught the women secretly how to create spaces and a practice of mourning um, through poetry, through walking, through breathing, um, or performing. So th these type of events are actually very um, uh, private, intimate. Uh, so I only usually show my body rather than showing the other participants because it's not for display. Um, and in my context, it's kind of um, going back to my own narrative. So the, the idea is a lot of the, the work is about burials and how do we do this. So usually they are performed in long spaces of time, whether it's a few hours or a few days and a few nights. And it's within that what type of transformation happens. So you're not just there to, to re-perform the violence. It's about to understand what bore morte is, what death is. Um, what a practice of reclaiming those spaces and your own identity by going through a process. Always death, as I say, is not the end. It's about a process, a transformation. Might not be understood, uh, but it's that pro procession of this transformation that leads to something, that leads to another type of language um, and resistance of your body. So in, um, when I was working in Nairobi, in Kenya, I was also working with different um, women that worked, for example, in um, the tulip industries, uh, actually from the Netherlands, uh, that are polluting uh, spaces uh, down in the valley, notably Naivasha Valley, which is quite w well known for this, where you have basically Dutch tulip industries that are completely polluting the rivers and the lakes. Uh, most women die of cancers, of infections, um, but there is no um, a court that's been applied against those industries. And so actually, basically, all the flowers that you get here are from Kenya, or from Naivasha specifically, and they are harvested uh, by these women that I was able to um, work with and stay with. So in, in Kenya also, it's very difficult because the history of resistance and revolt of black women is illegal under British law, still up to today. So there is no, you cannot go and find information, whether in institutions, um, because you can get a prison sentence or there's penalties for that. So that was actually what I wanted to do there and I ended up a bit on a brick wall. Um, and I wanted to understand the stories of, especially black queer women, um, and it turns out that um, a lot of the, the stories that we can find will not be in institutions anyway. I will get back to this later. But they're going to be from people that you meet. It's a, very, it's, it's a very profound, engaging, long process that's very intimate in, inside people's homes who have certain archives, uh, including Mohamed Al-Lamin in, in this case, who was a journalist and who had basically documented about five decades of women's revolt in Kenya, which is not owned by the Kenyan government, so therefore, this bypasses the law <laughs> that we are not allowed to display any of this information or talk about it. Um, but this, for example, is just one example of how to deal with, um, with personal archives and how do you share, how do you make this accessi accessible to the descendants. Um, so also, what is very important is when looking at ancestry, um, normally I work directly with people, I will show you this later, but it's a very personal process for many hours or many days. Uh, this is part of the Obea, um, where you can identify people's illnesses that are usually chronic, that are usually reoccurring uh, directly in lineage to the traumas that happen in their ancestry. So technically, normally, ancestors are not there to harm you, however, however they accompany you, and however you live your life today. We always say that you're in control of your life, indirectly, not totally. You are always accompanied by the stories before you, they are very present, but that past walks with you. That means that manifest also in decisions that you make and illnesses that you carry. These are not accidental. Um, often these ancestors doesn't mean they are there to protect you, but they don't have the answers to everything. You have to take care of them too. Therefore, Obeya is a system for me to give individual persons their own ritual, their own ritual of healing, of 
self-care, had to reuse that term <laughs> in these times, um, but in order to deactivate this trauma, dismantle it time after time so that those chronic illnesses eventually go away and you have a different relationship to your own ancestry. Therefore, there's better clarity, there's a better understanding of language and how you're going to practice and perform your history. Um, and in order to do that also, spaces are really important. So the architectures, they're not just architecture, but I'm talking about the ruinations of things. So the ruinations of objects, ruinations of sounds. Like if you have, for example, ants crawling in between buildings, this is a sound that will give you the architecture of the colonial histories that are there. You might not hear it from your ears, but the frequency is there and it exists and you have to find a way to amplify it. So. This, for example, when I came to Berlin, it was very destabilizing for me because the amount of discrimination was horrific, and, but it had to become my home at some point. Uh, so I was looking back at my family ancestry because my great-grandfather was a prisoner of war in Gabon. The, no the northern part of Gabon in Volontem was German colonized at some point until 1915. And my grandfather was, uh, I guess, a resistant activist of the time, but then was in prison inside a German concentration camp in Gabon. So the concentration camps were not just in Europe, but also in the colonies. And he passed away there. Uh, it's not sure how, but we can just um, speculate and what conditions they were. Um, and based on, on that story, I was trying to find his traces in Berlin. What could I find in those archives? So I had issues with those archives because most of the time I, didn't, I couldn't even enter the, uh, these institutions because of full-on discrimination. Uh, as a black woman who's not German, who couldn't understand the language, I was not able to access uh, the material, even though I would be a direct descendant of what had happened there. Also because normally historians or archivists feel a little bit threatened about your position, why are you here? Um, technically that's illegal for them to do, but they still do it. So that's why I'm very, very dependent on these kind of personal interactions with people. So it's basically, a lot is based on luck, but it's also based on patience and generosity and unlove. You have to trust people around you to do that. Um, one of the, the archives that was, yes. Oh my God. Sorry, can you oh wait, move, move up? I, I forgot to give you so that. <laughs> one of the pictures. That was Nairobi. <laughs> so that's Nairobi. <laughs> one of the images from Mohamed Lamin that shows, basically this is 1963. These are black queer women um, inside a, a public resistance revolt in um, Nairobi at the time. Um, but also they are um, obeah women because they are Go back, yes, because they are showing, you can see some of them are holding plants. So this is already, already talking about climate change, climate crisis, plant histories and all that. This is 1963. Um, next one. <laughs> next one, yes. This, so this is what I'm talking about by spaces. Um, uh, those photographs specifically are in, inside Berlin. I will get to it in a minute later. Next one. Um, and this is the archive that was interesting for me. This is what they call the Lara Archive. So these are vinyl records. So this is where you will hear voices of ancestors from 1920 or to 1946. Uh, this was specifically the Willem Durgen collection. There are many types of vinyl records from this time that you have in Switzerland, uh, even in Denmark, in Finland, in, uh, in Germany, etc. cetera. Um, and the idea with the Willem Dorgan um, collection was, uh, was a project by the government that was funded by the, the Deutsche Bank that asked Willem Dorgan to create um, a museum of world cultures through sound. So the idea was that they got money to travel and to record these you know, persons from different places in the world, not just in Africa, but Latin America, anywhere where the colonies were active. However, Turns out that the, in that specific collection of 9,500 recordings, none of them were recorded abroad. They were all recorded in Berlin because it turns out that the majority of these recordings come from um, black soldiers, 
uh, from the French and the British colonies who were prisoners in colonial camps in Berlin, um, including women, uh, including women soldiers, or they, they, so then they used them to, for entertainment purposes. They put them in human zoos, they used them for scientific purposes, for experimentation, but they also, yes, they also use them as records, not just photographic, but, but sound. So this is something that was not really concentrated on. We were very used to see photographic, objectified images of persons, but we don't reconsider really the sonic archive. So what is even more disturbing is that they would collect these um, sounds and then they're about one minute, two minutes, very short. And then they would display it in rooms like this, like exhibition rooms and say, how beautiful these sounds are, how beautiful these accents are, how, oh, you know, and actually these soldiers were calling for help. They were saying how they were being tortured by the German generals how they were being killed, how they were being silenced, or some of them were forced to basically uh, repeat a script in German in their own languages. Uh, so it was very, um, very forced, and in that collection, uh, the archivist told me, yeah, there are no women in there, it's only men that have been recorded, because Germany believed that history should only be created by men, not by women. Women are only there to reproduce children. So therefore, I investigated further, I spent more time, and I eventually found 172 recordings of women. There are more now. Uh, but this was the first time since 1920. Because the documentation, the written documentation, also is falsified. Therefore, gender is falsified. Some of the years are falsified. The translation are completely falsified. So therefore, you come into an archive that is historically completely wrong. Um, and based on the perception of one white man. So this, I showed this one, um, there's a lady there called Virikitama. That was the first vinyl record of a, of a woman that I found. She was from Kerala, who was forcibly migrated to Germany inside the, 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 the uh, human zoo for entertainment purposes. And basically you hear her um, singing um, in Tamil, but forcibly. And when you hear the first time, you think, oh, you know, she sounds happy because she's laughing, she's making mistakes, and she has to start again. She is not resisting. It's, it, the, the, one of the first propositions was that, oh, she's resisting against the technology of the, of the recording. She is not. This lady has been drugged and has been forced into alcoholism, is being raped. These are the two men where she has to be entertained, uh, has, that she has to perform with and entertain the German public. Um, and so these are the forms of feminist oppressions that were happening. And now how do we find uh, systems of resilience within these operations of technologies um, inside? So of course there's been like a massive migration uh, between 1890s, uh, next one, sorry, next one between 1890s to the 1950s of um, African persons, but also from First Nations uh, everywhere. But it, it's not so much talked about um, uh, now. So the, for me, it was very important to look at what does a form of resistance and resilience looks like in practice inside those industries of oppression, of colonial methodologies against migrants. Um, and I focused also a lot on uh, clues that were that you could find and for example the the Brucke painter movements where they they paint all these black women in Berlin and said but who are these black women where they're coming from what are they doing um, and actually a lot of them were coming for for work or were forcibly um, moved from their homes and um, were actors. Most of them were actors or singers, but they were also spies, they were also pharmacists, they were lawyers, but, there's n but we don't talk about this. So a lot of them we see in the archives like Millie, Millie Gwynn, so a lot of them had the same name. So you see the Nelly, Nilly, Mel, uh, it's always like repeating in those archives, but it doesn't mean that it's the same women. But uh, they use these artist names in order to navigate through the industry. So then you see them um, uh, coming up in colonial films, uh, like uh, this is Emin Zerazinza. Switch it, yeah, thank you, I keep. <laughs> Um, so this is Emin Zerazinza, who's um, uh, featuring one of the colonial films in 1937, um, uh, where she's also speaking in different languages in that film, which is interesting. 
but we, they are not credited. We don't know their names, we don't know uh, where they're coming from, and we found out that the, the company responsible called UEFA Studios, which is still existing in Berlin, uh, hired black women as prop makers, but also as script writers or editors. Uh, a lot of the script making were actually done by German women, um, and basically you can identify what was going on in terms of the, the German project uh, uh, and how this was an added to how to create war against the British and the French and the Germans would say, oh, but we are better colonialists than you because look how well we treat our migrants, look at what we were actually the atrocities and the genocides that were happening um, massively are much more accounted for against the, the Germans. Um, which is, was written also in O'Reilly's book, Thomas O'Reilly, O'Reilly's book called The Blue Book in 1913, which was banned later on. Um, so this is what I mean. This is one of the kind of the after work of the ancestral healing processes. So after a few hours uh, of communicating with, um, uh, with ancestors, which is usually, it's not, um, I'm, I'm very simple, I just touch people. So I'm not using any objects, usually I just, I just touch people and I breathe with them and I spend time with them and what happens is that there are certain images that come up. Uh, there are either ancestors that are very present with you, that know that you're there and they're really confused. Some of them will show you their stories, so they will show you specific landscapes, usually of where they are stuck. Not all of these landscapes uh, are traumatic um, and I'm not in, it's not in my place to maybe d disclose all the information to that person because that might be too much. Um, but then through this process, then uh, some things open up. So actually also certain marks that happen on your body, whether it's self-harm or even tattoos or scars are absolutely identifiable with that ancestor. Uh, the, 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 the same marks would be there, or um, uh, the, the, the same rhythms, especially uh, with self-harming victims, uh, it's very, very clear. These rhythms and these marks are already performed by the ancestor previously, so it's about how to dismantle that. So it's not a process, it's not an, an art form, but what I do usually, so this was specifically thinking about a way of um, monumentizing um, uh, the, basically the lives of black women, black Jewish women inside the concentration camps in Germany um, through this mobile archive. After this procession of rituals, and um, the participants would, would basically perform to the camera uh, a monument, a statement. Next one. So, uh, you, I should go to the next one after that. Next one? Yeah. So th then with those archives, um, I looked at the, uh, specifically in Namibia, um, uh, leaders of resistance movements, which was basically 90% women and not men, uh, but whose stories were not identified, whose names were not recognized. Um, and these come from also private archives, from private families, uh, and they keep reoccurring in different type of albums between Germany and Switzerland, notably. And um, I wanted to work um, to acknowledge their presence which is all, it's always a question of how you display, you know, these images and not objectify um, their bodies again. Um, so go back to the previous one. So, yeah, and then basically is to use them in the spaces where, so this is in Tempelhof, the former airport in Berlin, where actually it was the first, not only was the, the, the airport a industry, um, not ju just for planes, but it was also a weapons industry where black women and Asian communities were forcibly uh, working in and also became very sick. They had illnesses, cancers and chronic illnesses uh, and they never got compensation for that. It's also the same place where the first experimentation of concentration camp methods were there, so they built these barracks uh, and gas chambers on this field to experiment, to see what worked, and the first people who were going to be killed were basically black soldiers, 
who were coming from the um, uh, Wunsdorf concentra uh, um, colonial camp with the train directly into this field and then basically uh, being um, experimented on. So uh, often uh, I would do these kind of rituals with persons using how, that w how do we transform these archives. They would create these kites, they would fly them in the sky, and then German people would just say that basically we were racist because uh, we were racist against white Germans. So then there's this whole complex narratives that come out about discrimination, racism, and reclaiming. And so they couldn't stand the fact that basically this, uh, this uh, clouds of kites of black women that was supposed to be about remembrance was actually for them an attack against white Germans. Um, and a lot of people <laughs> were, uh, felt, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, terrified to see that. So if you go next, and next again. So then there is a colonial film in 1942, which is the biography of Carl Peters, who was one of the most prominent, dangerous uh, colonialists, and actually Bismarck took him out of, um, of the colonies because he generated so many genocides, especially in East Africa. And basically for the Germans, Nazi Germany, to kind of reclaim the colonies and to uh, say to the public, we need to get back our colonies in Africa. So they had to generate all the whole system of films, um, of propaganda, um, where they would use basically these um, uh, black soldiers, men and women, inside the colonial films to reperform certain reenactments and basically shoot them in the film. And basically the German European public were watching these movies, propaganda movies, thinking it's cinema, but it's not. They were actually killed on these fields in Berlin. And what I spent the last year was actually identifying these spaces. So nobody had done this, nobody had talked about this, nobody had made this work of remembering or even uh, assigning uh, 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 or questioning if this can go to the juridiso code system. And so what happened is when I went back to the spaces and Marine Hur was the first one, uh, we find the remnants, we find bones, we find things from that time in particular in 1942, which match. So there's these whole masses of graves that are, are completely unmarked. The, uh, for, uh, the Senate is still not interested in it. Um, and so what I did is I tried to think about those films and instead of just re displaying those films or showing you, you can find it on YouTube if you want. It's called Carpet, it's 1942, directed by Helbert Selpin. Um, and it's finding these like key moments in the film where it's actually the, the, the direct descendants of these black soldiers that were inside these colonial camps in Germany who survived. It's their great, great granddaughters who are talking. So a lot of them are either great granddaughters from the Schutztruppe or for South African uh, British uh, troops um, or Indian troops. And they are uh, 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 basically reclaiming those spaces, these monuments in Berlin that are so oppressing. And it's them talking with their own narrative, full poetry, full whispering, full action. Next one. So this would be, this is Mariner. This is exactly the field where um, parts of Carl Peters were shot, where notably the, um, the black soldiers were, were shot. Also, you'll find this in Victory of the West, which is, which is also on YouTube. So I would take people, try to think about what props in the movies that they were using, including the, 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 like the Kilimanjaro, which is always like the prominent symbol for German empire, and walk through this, through sound, through, um, through performing, um, through, through videos, through archives, all of that, um, and generate new questions for the community to engage. Next one. So of course, this is not just for, in the German context, we have to look also in different places, um, as in uh, Saint Louis in Senegal, which is where the first colonial French black soldiers were hired. There's also a prison there. Um, so th there's the same taboo there. Like um, if you make um, a space or remembrance to black women soldiers of that time, black <laughs> men uh, who were soldiers in the 1960s, this is more like Vietnam War kind of um, time, they actually would say, but why are you commemorating women soldiers? Because they were, they were whores. 
they were prostitutes. They don't need space for commemoration. So then it opens up another kind of uh, very uneasy discussion about, you know, because this is how colonialism works. Um, and so I worked actually with the farmers, that's why the goats, the, the farmers are the direct descendants of the soldiers that were imprisoned there. The prison is just off this picture there. And basically we go around the city um, with, the, uh, with the, the names, some of them with the portraits and uh, the testimonies of these black women. And by the time we come to the prison, the goats start to scream and it sounds like black women screaming and then run away through the street. Um, so there's certain things about, next one, there's certain things about monuments that we don't see, right? It's all about, we always think about, this is the problem of our monuments in the Eurocentric context. It has to be seen, it has to be so phallic, it has to be so heavy, it has to be so wide, it has to be so marbled, it has to be, you know? No, a monument, it doesn't, it should, a monument shouldn't be anti-monument, it shouldn't be even uh, decolonial. A monument is about the things that we don't see. It doesn't mean that the things that we don't see doesn't exist or that we don't remember. So again, now this is now a combination of ancestral work um, and thinking about, so I, these are the, some of the women in, in, in the, the, the work that I found in archives. We don't know the full story for them, but basically I wanted a confrontation between three black women <laughs> um, in, in sharing their experiences of colonialism and feminism uh, and parenthood with uh, three basically white women around the same period. So we're talking like 1890s to 1940s or 1960s. Um, and I recreated a script, a two hour script of these women speaking. So after going through, for looking at the indications of the archives, what is left over, whether it's in these vinyl records, whether it's in literature, whether it's in the colonial films, whether it's in photography, whether it's in museums. Um, from these traits, uh, I, I create a script. And I can identify how these women actually connect, not just in terms of the time, but in terms of the work that they do, because it seems that these women, they're all connected. So you have Unika Tsun, who was the daughter of one of the most uh, horrible uh, German generals in Namibia, in Windhoek, who was a grave digger and had killed um, a Namibian princess at the time. And she's the direct daughter of this guy. Um, she was a famous Dadaist writer and um, artist who committed suicide in 1963, I believe, in Paris. And it turns out one of the presents that her father gave her from Namibia actually was the skull of this princess, which had a fracture here in the brain. When Unika committed suicide, um, from her balcony, when they found her body from the seventh floor, she had no broken bones on her body apart from the, the, the same um, uh, fracture on the skull that was on her desk in the apartment. So this is how ancestors work, right? So basically, the work that she was doing, uh, if you read her work, I hate it, it's horrific. Um, <laughs> but it ties in, she talks about when she was working at uh, UFI Studios, do, do, was an editor, script writer, uh, knew some of the black actors, had affairs with black men. She had this ideology because she didn't know her father so well. She started to create this ideology that her father was this black hero, this black man who was gonna take her, save her from her pedophilic mom um, and take her to Africa. And so she was very influenced by the movies. Therefore, that's why she worked there. But some of the stories that she says, she talks about Mia May, who was a Jew, uh, who was working di directly with these actors, who are, uh, she's in most of the colonial films as the protagonist, as this white queen or princess uh, being attacked by these what they called savages at the time. Um, and Frida von Bulau, who was, uh, um, one, what was, who was considered one of the first feminist German uh, writers uh, whose, whose writing was directly, directly plagiarized in the book of, of, of Hitler. So Hitler actually used her work uh, to talk about his experiences, but word by word. Huh? So, and, but her, her work was considered a feminist Afrofuturism in, in the 1890s to the 1910s. So this becomes complex, right? And then, so now you have the three women, you have Emine from the movies, movie cinema, the actress, Maria Mandesi Beljop, who is one of the 
da daughters of the dynasty of the Manga Bell um, uh, family, and then you have Erika and Gabriel Cuyo as an Afro-German who talk about their experience inside the, the, uh, the movie industry and actually the genocides that were happening. Therefore, when we hear them speaking in the space, I recreate on the, um, on the Ruins of Paradise, which was one of the first uh, female films that was done in 1920 that was banned three years later because it shows women's resistance and forms of rape. Uh, and the people in the exhibition have to have to create the story. They have to recreate the script. They have to change everything in the exhibition. So it's not a fixed thing. You touch it, you change it, and based on the, um, the ruinations that they are, next one, you recreate the, the, the voices of resistance of these women. Um, so this is just an example also of thinking about ancestry in Yaounde. There was uh, also several movements of revolts in the forest nearby. Um, and basically using the plants, what I do is that I record the vibration of these plants. The plants' vibration are testimonies to what happened, to the trauma that happens. So the, the, the sound frequencies change not according to species, but according to what happened in that place. So if something traumatic has happened, the frequency will be much higher than if, some, if, it's, if it's more at peace, the frequencies are much lower. Um, so I, I, I like to combine these, um, this interaction, next one, and think about those ruinations because often in museums and docu documents, either you don't have access to it, they are missing or they are burnt, so you're left with ashes, but often these ashes too, they have the vibration. So ashes from the archives in Namibia or ashes from the archives in Bahia in Brazil, same, they emit a vibration. They have a story to tell, they have a voice. This is a feminist way of thinking about how to dismantle or decentralize uh, colonized memories of, uh, of how we think of, uh, of the external world. Next one. Examples are going to the same spaces in Berlin where actually these memories are still very present. This is Sarotti Chocolate Factory, which is still there. Um, and going to the exact spaces where um, that chocolate factory had actually also committed crimes um, uh, and genocides in the spaces. They don't look like nothing now because now this, look, this is a car park, but this is actually the spaces where there were hangings of black people. Next one. Um, on the other side, there's also how it relates to contemporary experiences. So I work a lot with um, uh, black um, feminist organizations, including International Women's Space, where we find ways and tools of resistance of protections for black women. Uh, this is celebrating 10 years of Orion Platz movement. This was last October with Angela Davis, uh, where we come back to the place where women had resistance, who had formed the, the Orion Platz movement, but the German had mediatized it as a black male movement, somehow, without acknowledging these women at all. Um, but it also um, showed the disparities and it exposed the entire racist system inside Germany and how the actually the system of uh, apartheid in South Africa was based on the original German laws in Germany which were still being used uh, still being used against migrants to to close their mobility uh, next one okay this is again this is part of the on the ruins of paradise next one and so then I worked, I, I worked in the last few years with looking at, um, uh, uh, how do you say, like uh, court documents of black women. So, uh, but this is in different contexts. So I looked at court documents in, in Namibia, uh, the first um, women that actually went into German court uh, to testify against sexual assault, land disposition, uh, uh, and colonial, um, uh, illegal uh, genocides, um, they were opened by black women, not men. Uh, yet when we talk about movements of resistance on the continent, we focus on male figures, but the actual work has been done by black women. This was the foundational fabrics. Um, and so I was trying to figure out also with the contemporary um, court cases of migrant black women, uh, also in sexual assault cases. Uh, also, this was the work that I was doing recently in Bahia. You will see it in a bit. 
um, and how to create this space of empowerment. So we, it's uh, thinking about the uh, architecture of the court system, um, but thinking ab about it as a tribunal. So next one. And so I invited over several weeks um, different women activists, artists, lawyers to activate the space through radio programs, through performances, through singing, through poetry in different ways to reclaim uh, those narratives. Next one. Uh, so this would be then the work in Bahia recently. So we're looking at uh, different kind of plant histories and plants that were used in 18. 40s or 1830s with Maria Filippa, one of the most well-known um, uh, revolt activists uh, in Itaparica Island, and which plants were used to as weapons, actually, against the, the colonialists. And every time the persons would walk into the space, the when you touch the plants, the sounds would activate, and then you would hear some of the court cases of black women from 1760s, to 1904. And this was the first time in the state of Salvador, in Bahia, that these court documents were open. They have never been opened before. So when I requested it, and we were looking for these documents, they had not been opened since uh, 1760 or you know, uh, 1834, which included the court case of Maria Filippa. And 90% of these court cases, when we talk about fighting uh, injustice or colonialism, 90% of it was se sexual assault. Right, and most of these sexual so were being perpetrated not just by not white men, <laughs> but black men and also white women. So actually the perpetrators were mostly white women and black men, and this is what uh, black women were fighting for. Most of them lost, not because they were not telling the truth, it's because either the, the um, evidence was obstructed, the court was extremely racist and illiterate, um, and they didn't have enough finances to pay the courts. So um, the reason why I went into that direction, it's because I'm also experiencing that. It's not because it's a topic or it's interesting because it's something that I'm living, so I know how to, how to navigate this. Next one. So same, this is like thinking about how um, using the sounds of the, the archives and involving the, the stories of, um, this is when I was working with a group of Syrian refugees who came uh, to Germany and then they were selling their clothes. And so of course all the clothes, yet you would see all the, um, the stains, the, the holes, the blood of the stories of the, of the La Traversée, fin, every step that they uh, went through. And they were selling them on the streets to make money. Um, so they, uh, this was in Denmark. This court is, uh, this courtyard is actually a you know, contemporary museum, but it's also the, um, the same courtyard where they were selling uh, enslaved Africans, uh, they actually banned the work because they were like, oh, no, 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 but Denmark was not part of this history. Like, why would you want to expose this? Uh, so it was kind of abrupted in the middle of it. But um, but the, um, so some of the Syrian refugees, of the community uh, came. Um, we had some series of workshops, intimate in, uh, workshops, and they created this tent of these clothes that they were traveling with. Uh, that denounced some of the um, uh, the violence that happened to them. Next one, and then basically mm, to kind of close it um, as another example. When I um, when I went back to the colonial, the first colonial camp that was built in 1915 in uh, just outside of Berlin, it's called Wunsdorf um, um, camp. Um, uh, this is where they housed over 10,000 black prisoners. Uh, and basically, exactly 100 years later, so in 2015, when there was this massive migration of Syrian refugees, they rebuilt the same barracks. So imagine this landscape here. You see the blue barracks? So imagine this 100 years before um, with, um, with uh, um, wood barracks. Uh, they recreated the same barracks, the same dimensions, at the same position, with the same numbers. The numbering of the barracks 100 years later is exactly the same. And the buildings that were around it are basically the buildings that were when the, when the Nazis basically 
plus the war, then the, the Soviet Union came and created their own uh, also form of uh, oppression. And so they actually, these houses were for not only workers, also prisoners, and then the Syrian refugees also have to live in that and are going through a, a huge traumatic experiences. Uh, that at the time, um, exactly the same, when I was interviewed several times on TV or on, on journals, and I was saying that basically I found direct evidence objects in for that time, so immediately archaeologists came and the state wanted to basically erase what was happening. So this was in the process, that's why you see the, the machine there. And then the, 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 the top there, this is like this is kind of to show you before because it, there was a, a mosque there that was built for the prisoners, but of course it wasn't for the prisoners. The majority of them were Muslims, but they were not allowed to pray inside. This was just a, this was just a fantasy. It was just kind of recreating Disney-like ask for you know to show uh, poli politically to show how well we treat their prisoners, but the prisoners were actually outside with guns on their head when they were praying, and then just down there is the lake next to it where they hide all the ev evidence. So when they lost the war, they had to destroy everything uh, so that they uh, wouldn't get caught, and they hide all the evidence, and this is where I found all the objects, including the bullets, the machinery, the clothing, the caskets, everything. They're still not interested. People are just swimming in there like it's recreational time. Uh, but this is also where I did a series of uh, rituals on the water. And then the last slide is basically how to deal with those stories, how those women, black women, are reclaiming those spaces. Um, and one of the stories, one of the first black theater was called um, uh, um, uh, uh, Son and Afghan in Organland, which is like um, sunrise in the east, which is actually a very derogative racist term at its time. And they wanted to create like a whole theater piece made by the black diaspora in different languages to denounce the perpetration of genocide by theater makers, by theater institutions, which were killing black actors at the back of those theater spaces during the war, um, but also a lot of them were organized and scripted by black women, but the black men took over the ownership, sold the stories to white um, theater makers and never made any money, and they tried, so the black women went into court against the black men, against their kin, against their lovers, uh, but then they don't win. So the, then this became this, this story about love uh, and how they they talk about basically betrayal and what what is inside the script, how the script has been changed, and how the narrative should be told. So these are just examples of the practice that I do. And you notice that I'm not showing any. Uh, I try not to show any. Um, uh, um, uh, how do you say uh, museum? Uh, for, for like we uh, colonial photography or show you the because uh, this is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. The idea is not, not to show again, to prove that it exists. Uh, we are already performing this every day. So the idea is really to really transform all of this material and to understand what is our relationship to our spaces now and to ourselves now. Um, not everything needs to be shown, but for me, this is a way to think about monuments. Uh, monuments should be and have the right to be quiet. Uh, this is something that also in a lot of black movements, including the, 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 womb, the free womb movement that I learned in, in Bahia, was the, the right to silence. Actually, black women wanted a law to say that they could have... So it's, it's a very difficult thing to do because you have Audre Lorde saying that, you know, silence will kill you. Yes, it will. But then there are also, depending on the context and the, context and the space and how you work with the law, the, the, the freedom of silence to survive. So this is something that in our contemporary bodies, it's hard to navigate with. But this is what I've, I consider how we can maybe think about monuments um, in a different way. So I will just close it right now. But thank you for listening. Amazing. Thank you very much to Angesomo, to uh, Cristina, of course, and to Anna. And now we will have a 10 minutes break before we come back for a conversation with the three of them. So please, let's try to rest a little bit and to um, start receiving everything that we have been listening to. Thank you. We come back in 10 minutes. <laughs>
okay, well, um, it's time to come back. Um, Chris, Cristina, Ana, and Gesomo, please, can you take your places? Uh, so, for all of you who are still with us, thank you very much. It has been, a, as I promise, a very exciting kind of listening. And I'm very grateful that Ibelice prepared us for that possibility of receiving everything that we have been given so far. Now, in this conversation, we're going to be um, inviting the three amazing uh, artists that we have just listened to to reflect a little bit more on two particular topics. And these are the questions of uh, collective mourning and the colonial healing. So I'm going to be formulating some questions. Um, and of course, uh, each of you is um, free to respond to any of these. Or if you prefer to pass, of course, we can actually ask to the audience <laughs> if they can come in. Of course, we also are going to open the uh, possibility for you to ask questions for any of them. So let me start with the first one that is about collecting mourning. We have been uh, listening to very tough and difficult stories, stories that are concrete and grounded in territories, in bodies, in erased histories, her stories. And um, the first question that I have to um, each of you, if you can reflect about that. First of all, what is collective healing for each of you? And, um, and to what extent uh, do you think that by grounding our griefs in these territories, in these archives, in silences, are we actually able to, um, to collectively heal? If you can reflect a little bit on how your work is actually enabling um, to do this kind, enabling you and others to do this grounding of griefs. Who wants to answer this question? <laughs> ah, you have a mic. Go ahead, Christina. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I was um, thinking about collective healing, um, I, rem I remember these uh, first periods of time when I was, um, I feel unprotected and unsafe, uh, not just only for comments or actions that I receive. Just also because I, I was trying to understand my situation, my identity, uh, me as a woman in this context where I live, and trying to find, um, try to rediscover my identity, because also that was a uh, value for me. And to, uh, it was like a journey to find women that helped me. I rediscovered myself when I talked to these uh, wonderful women. I think that in every, in each conversation, we could heal each other. I think the action of also listen to the other it's, it's so powerful and have this moment of respect of your tears and respect your memory. Try to connect with the memory of our ancestors, of grandmothers and mothers and, and all the story that is there and it was uh, silent for the institution, the, poli the government, the politics, the, the, the religion, having, having even the medical system, they silence your knowledge, they silence um, your experience. And I think in the collective, we can find this moment of, of power. And, and we can't just, when, when I, I think in this, mo in this, what it means to heal, it's, um, it's repair. And we are repairing and we are resisting and, and we are like, a, an, uh, an organic. I see me and my friends like we can't. We, <laughs> we can create fire. 
we can make it burn everything. We can create er an earthquake on the, in everywhere. So I find in, in this uh, in this uh, in these moments uh, as something very very special uh, for us. I think the healing is it's collective. It's a moment to share. It's a moment to to receive and. I don't know if I understand. <laughs> you are responding the question. I think that um, let me let me let me try to connect what you are saying about this possibility of being listened, being seen to something that for me was very important from the work of of um, eh, em, from, from the work of um, Anna, but also on the work of Engesomo. En, en um, how can we heal then if 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 we are in silence? Um, um, I saw this this energy that you said of uh, being able to speak, being able to be listened. And I understand that there is a huge difference between being silence or to remain in silence. That it speaks about the possibility of, of, of agency, of empowerment, of, of reconnecting not only with ourselves but with others. So in trying to connect the world that I see between you, Christina, and also Anna, um, I see bodies in movement, bodies grie uh, grie grieving, and my question will be also for um, Anna and Ingesoma: How can we then heal and ground our 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 griefs in a way that has this difference between be silence or remain silence? Um, I don't know. If you want to take that over, given that you mentioned uh, Ingesoma, very important things there. I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I come from, uh, from a perspective that's very difficult because in my experience of collective work, of collective healing, collective grief, it is painful. It 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 never. It's not sustainable long term in the sense that, look at the period of healing that you need after a trauma event, it will take some time. It could take a few weeks, it could take a few months, it could take years, it could take a lifetime. Um, Angela Davis always said that, you know, a movement, that's why it's called a movement, because it comes and it goes. So th uh, I, from my experience, working with collectives, working with people that I love, working with friends, um, and I see that also in every single women, um, like movement, that was initiated by black women, it dismantles. It doesn't mean that it didn't work. It means that this is part of grief work. It's, it's painful, it's never sustainable. It, movement doesn't do that. In order for things to change, things come together and things dismantle. And it can be very, very painful because you will lose best friends, uh, whether you are uh, silenced and killed by the state, or, or each other. So we, that's one thing we don't talk about. We always talk about the conflict and the danger between the people, the populations and the state. We don't talk about the dangers and the conflicts between ourselves, whether it's between black people, between queers, between, we don't talk about it, but it's, it's real and that's how things dismantle. Um, and it's, it's unsafe and I really appreciate the quote that you said earlier because it's both, you know, you, if, if we are silent, we are, if we remain silent, we are going to be killed. If we break our silence, we will be killed also. So it's really like, uh, it's that. It, it's, you, you don't, it, it's based on your position because sometimes you need silence either to protect yourself, whether it's your mental health simply, or other collectives of persons. Even that you think, but no, this is the truth, this is the justice. No, justice has different forms. Like, and, and that's why collective work is difficult because sometimes collective work, you will feel on your own or you will feel isolated. But this is the real work, that is grief. And you have to accept it. We have this mythology, uh, a friend of mine told me in Namibia, when persons during the genocide were forced to migrate and move in the desert, they had to look forward, they had to go ahead. And for those who turned around and look at the past behind them, they turned into plants, into trees, 
and they couldn't move anymore. And so you will see when you go to these deserts in Namibia, you will see those trees. So I say this is the mythology of the of the people, but it's 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 what they call this is grief work. This is uh, so I I I think in a way there are there are different phases to collective mourning and empowerment. Uh, because you have to look ahead. You have that energy. You feel loved. You feel, you feel like you have a home. You feel like you have an anchor. You feel like you mean some, somewhere. You belong somewhere. But that same feeling for that same movement, and this is what you have to ex accept. And that is, that's another uh, process. And it is extremely, extremely painful. And that was what I was trying to show with the Ohanianplatz movement. It was uh, basically all the women that were leading it were, were killed either by the state or were killed with, because of chronic illnesses, cancers, and they just disappeared. That's justice. That's the, that's, so I think like it's, it's, um, uh, as long as we're aware of that, that we don't just uh, create a language of uh, collective healing or mourning or transformational justice that is not too romanticized because this is the real work. And you have to be ready to get broken, to die, to come back, but you can never be the same. You always have to. So this is the dilemma, and that goes with the same discourse as with Audre Lorde or uh, with the, the, the movements of black women who were saying, but no, it's also all right to, to stay silent. It, they didn't see that as an oppression. They saw that for that context against the judicial system to protect themselves. Thank you very much. This brings me to um, a, a need to connect somehow with um, what we saw in the different practices because, for example, in your case, Anna, uh, the, the body in movement is not necessarily a body that is speaking uh, with words, but with the whole body. So it's, a, it's not necessarily a completely in silence body. It's a body that is speaking differently, uh, not necessarily by uh, speaking to each other, but by, as you say, by using the body differently. So let me bring what uh, we were just listening to and try to ask you in relation to what we saw in your installation upstairs, but also in your work, on what is then the role of this body uh, that is trying to heal collectively and is also conscious that there are waves of grief of going down or uh, being strong and being with others strong. What is the role of that body healing from um, all the wounds that we are trying to, to heal from? Uh, I think, uh, well, the role is fundamental, no? Because we are here present with our bodies. Um, and, uh, and I think maybe what I have uh, learned through this, uh, I, I agree completely with uh, Angesomo about how hard and how difficult it is to work collectively and to work together. Um, uh, and, but I think what I have learned through these experiences is also how uh, there is a moment that you can feel, or that has been my experience, to feel that uh, this body, it connects to other bodies, and then you can see and recognize that there is a bigger body, that it goes before these borders that we have been, I think, also trained to understand our body as this physical uh, blood and, uh, yeah, no matter, uh, that, but we are interconnected with each other, and I think for me, um, thinking about the body movements and the healing collectively is is going back to that to open our uh, senses and to be uh, aware enough in the present moment so that we can sense that we can not just think but that we can actually feel more than think but because it's, it, it is in this uh, deep feeling and sensing that we can realize that you don't need to think about it. You, you will feel it. You will feel how much you are connected to these others and to this collective body. Um, and, uh, and for me, this is the first uh, kind of like a step of this thinking about collective healing. No? It's like when, you, when there is a moment that in a way you surrender yourself to trying to calm your mind and go to just be present and feel and, and in that feeling connecting 
connecting yourself with, with others and with this uh, collective body. And that's how the collective healing for me in a way starts. And there is a long way, as Osanga Somo said, no? And there is a thing also what happens in these processes is to, that is, is not easy uh, and, and not everybody it is prepared and, uh, to, to go into that journey because also you need to have certain strength to deal with what this process will bring to you and into your path and into the group that you are working with because then you also recognize the differences about yeah, all of us have had different life experiences and some, and we also have had different, uh, I don't know, experience or inherited intergenerational traumas and we, some are more aware than other ones or, no, and I think also it's in this uh, being together that you, you kind of notice the differences and, and I think also the strength comes uh, when you are in a group to acknowledge and, and, and be able to see the differences and to be with them and to, hold them in a way and start weaving uh, with these differences to make uh, yeah, something that is good for everybody that is there participating no, in this. Um. Thank you, Anna. I, I wanted now to move into something that for me is very palpable from listening to the three of you and is how important for you is to be accountable to communities you work with or to ancestral communities that you are uh, related to in different ways. And my question here will be more in relation to um, how this is related to um, your art artistic practice, because sometimes we understand that, uh, especially in contemporary art, um, artists are fleeting, are nowhere placed, are nowhere uh, grounded, and I see lots of grounding in each of your um, practices. So to what extent, in which forms, um, you prepare yourself for the griefing uh, work that has to, the, the grief work, sorry, that has to be um, taking place, how this role of communities and friends and loved ones is central, how you bring this into your preparation as artists in each of the pieces that we were looking and y we, you were sharing with us today. Can you share a little bit of that process or that, let's say, exchange with others and with the communities you work with? I don't know if we can re reverse now the, um, the, uh, the direction of the answers. If you, if you would like to com comment a little bit, Anna. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, well, it's a process. <laughs> It's a process that I think actually, I don't feel that uh, uh, you can, in a way, prepare rationally. Uh, or at least in my experience, that is what have happened. That is like, I feel that I can, ca I don't know, like there is uh, not such a rational preparation, but uh, um, I, I have felt that is my life experience that have prepared me to arrive to certain places moments, get to meet certain people, and suddenly I'm there. <laughs> and there is a force that is kind of holding my back and in difficult moments. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, start, uh, I started experiencing and feeling this even stronger after I lost my mother. She passed away 12, 13 years ago already, and I think uh, going through this process of mourning uh, and loss, uh, it has been for me the preparation to, to be where I am and have also influenced uh, very strongly uh, my practice. My practice, I think that has been really uh, what happened at that moment and since that moment, everything that I have lived until now has been a preparation for do the work that I have been doing and yeah, developing kind of intuitively, I have to say. That is really powerful because I cannot remember, but I think that it was you, Christina, who said that, um, or you, Angesoma, I cannot remember, um, somehow illnesses and dealing with illnesses is a, is a way of uh, preparing yourself for the work or, or plays a role also in the way you uh, come into your artistic practices. So um, this connects a little bit on what Anna was saying. So you would like to follow up with this threat of how you are connected to communities or 
to particular events that shape the way you um, conduct your practices? Who would like to go? Cristina. Okay. I was thinking and uh, what we were saying about uh, how a family and our memory uh, also touch us in different ways. And when I was um, trying to think also on my experience with different diagnosis and treatment, I think I was in a period of my life when I was trying to understand also my identity and how I connect with the different elements that around me. And something happens, it wasn't, I wasn't uh, completely um, focused on that mind because it was so, so organic. Um, I just started to have these kind of questions, what kind of, what it means to heal, or what is makes me sick. And I was thinking, I don't feel okay. I don't feel good here. I don't, I feel a lot of symptoms, even when I'm outside, this is exhausting. And yeah, I also, I was sick. So everything in that moment link. And I was with these questions where, where I can find stuff my medicine yeah mm -hmm. and what what it is um so simple things i guess i was trying to be focused in my family family recipes mm. <laughs> and that was how i start um i was um my grandmother and uh, from my father's side also she passed away in 2017 so i was with um with all these emotions and 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 a, and a lot of, uh, and it was a deep universe inside of me that it needs to go out. So um, I think women help me in that way. How to say it? How to just also be okay with the silence? Because also when I think in silence, I think in these moments when I was weaving, because that was my my moment when I was trying to understand what is happening here. And also my family was present. I was trying to understand this, this question, like uh, me as a woman in this family, what it means or what it, how, how all the, the, the experience that the women in my family, they, they have to experience. So also that was very, I, just, I, I understood that also I was angry. I was so angry and with a lot of emotions and, and, and and, and try to do something with my body, try to express it and also share it and hug. Also it's something that it, it was, uh, I could eat and do it in public space. That was something that I feel like I was healing and not just only me. I was also helping or healing different parts of my family too. So it was not just only that it was uh, something that was happening in my, on me, in my skin. It's also that it, is, it was connected with, with different uh, uh, circumstances that happened. And every foot, every needle, every thread, every uh, moment just um, to prepare something that, uh, that was a, uh, the, the answer or oh, in that moment was uh, the, the, the ingredient that I needed. Once again, I know the connection with, um, between you, Christina, and what Inge Somo was sharing about uh, transgenerational trauma. Um, would you like to comment on that um, in relation to the question that I was asking uh, before that is about how this connects in your artistic practices? Yes, you asked a lot of things before, so I'm trying to <laughs> thread between accountability, collective work. Um, mm. I mean, uh, when you are in, in processes, I mean, I, that's why I say, you know, normally, often the work stems from 
the will to transform, the will to live, and the will to change also. And I think for any human being on this planet, illness is one of the propelling uh, experiences that can teach you how to do that. I mean, um, I think this is what in all the practices that we have, it's we see that we see an injustice. How do we communicate this to our collective, to our public, um, and to those who are also not willing to be a public, so, so okay. Uh, but like how to transform this, these events, this trauma, because you don't want to, it's, it's extremely dangerous to have to um, retell your trauma, yeah? Um, and the only way really, if we want to make this collective work in healing, it's really somatic. Sometimes you don't need to talk about it. And that's sometimes better. I think it depends on you know how you want to do it. Talking can also be it's it's fine, but I think you talk, but work with your body because the the body is basically going to be your first archive out of anything else. It's not the things that you find, the objects. It's always what's within. So you know, and this for you was very prominent, like how how your body is communicating, because you have to understand your, your body is your own language. It's speaking to you. So sometimes we are in environments that are extremely toxic. And we are in our mind, yes, collective work, healing, you know, we're doing this, this kind of warrior-esque practice. But it's, it's suicide sometimes, because we force ourselves then to become heroes. We force ourselves then to push, because we want to show, show how love is, how love works, what love can be, what the future can be. It's always about hope. Um, but you have, to, you have to also learn how to uh, uh, take care of yourself, and your body is telling you. So often, if you are in environments where you are... It, it, it can be anywhere, even at home with your family, you know, or in the university, or in the zone of war. Your body is going to tell you, this is not okay. I know, I'm not feeling safe. I need to get out. So you start to have these illnesses that you have for years and years and years. Your doctors don't know how to heal you. Sometimes your community doesn't know how to heal you. Because your, your body is speaking to you. And often we are not fluent in connecting with our body. And I like what the ritual that you started early with your bell to connect, you know, what's here to the roots of what is going to the ground, it's, it's really important. And actually, we have lost this practice as human beings. We do not know how to do this anymore. It seems very, very, very uh, simple, but we do not know how to do this on an everyday basis. And so that's how I always think that I, I almost lost my life just a few months ago in December 2022. I had a series of chronic illnesses. I was fighting for love. I was fighting for everything, a lot of things. And these illnesses went up and up and up. But my mind was saying that you are a warrior. You're going to get through this. I ended up with a massive tumor in my head, which was undetected for at least two years and nearly got me dead. And then I had uh, two operations, died on the operation table. Um, because it's your body is telling you, no, it's, um, it, things are not all right. So then these things start to come up in your body. You have, to, you have heart attacks, panic attacks, chronic pain. Uh, and then you realize it's because it's a very simple spaces that you are in. It could be people that are doing that to you. It could be a space that is doing that to you. But because you feel like you have responsibility all the time. And this is the thing about this work. It's about accountability and responsibility. But you are not holding responsibility and accountability for others if you can't account it for yourself. So that's why it's also really important to step back. You don't need to work all the time. You don't need to be worried all the time. Em em empowerment is really also saying no, learning how to actually learning the practice of, um, of doing nothing. Uh, it's not laziness, it's not unproductive, it's, 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 it's also part of the language. So I, I really think that what happens in our body is our sentences, our words, our poems, our archives, our songs, and we have to learn them first in order to, in order to do the work. And to do the work, you don't have to consistently do it and be on the driver's seat the whole time. You need to take breaks. You say, okay, 
I'm part of this movement, I'm part of this collective, but it's also okay to step back. If things crumble apart when you are not in it anymore, it's also okay. If people put you that pressure, said if you step out that things crumble, let it crumble. Because you have to, you, you are the heart. If, if, if everything, if collectivity is really about this exchange of, of our, our bodies and this connection, if your body is disconnected, and this associates you with self, then it cannot work. So actually it's, uh, it's also, <laughs> it's difficult, but it's also brave to step back. It's also, okay, I step back, I don't need to do this. I'm, I'm part of this for this time. Maybe if I come back later, I can, but it can only work if you really take care of yourself. And, you, and that means isolation also, because you have pressure from your own kin, you have pressure from your own collective, say, hey, no, you need to come back, no, you need to, no, 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 no. If you really love me, that's what love is. Let me step back, just give me a few moments, give me a few weeks, a few months, or even a few years, because otherwise the whole fabric falls apart. And if the whole fabric falls apart, then let's take also that time to, to rebuild together differently and that collective will, will, look, will feel different, but it's, it's like that. So take care of what's here. If you feel you have pains, if you occurs, the vibrations, the twitching, that's, a, that's sentences, my friend, like something is going on. You might take many, many years to figure out what the hell is going on, but it's real. That's, that's the first thing you need to do, and that's the only way, if you understand how your body works, you understand how your body talks to you, then, then you can only be, that's the only way to be inside this collective, that's the only way to be within your ancestry. Thank you so much, because it, it connects also back to um, some of the um, elements that Christina and Anna were bringing here about the um, Cuerpo territorio, uh, where bodies, territory, territory, cuerpo, tierra, we say in, in Spanish, and how for some of the land defenders, this was, even though that they are not here physically present with us, that was a concrete, uh, let's say, um, inspiration to continue defending the territory as if they were defending their body. And, um, and I really appreciate your words in that sense. But I, I, I have more questions, but I, I prefer that we open the, um, the possibility now for those who have been here very kindly and patiently listen and receiving from these three amazing women. If you want to formulate a question, please, this is the moment for you to um, come forward or I go with, towards you with the microphone. If anybody wants to ask a question, or engage, not necessarily a question, engage with a comment, a praise. <laughs> Maybe, I know this is for the audience and you're very welcome, but I, I also feel uh, something uh, uh, listening to to Angesomo that yeah. I would like to comment, and uh, not because it, it reminds me something that I have been learning with the uh, Feminismo Comunitario, is like communitarian feminism in, in Avia Yala, that is also another kind of branch of feminisms, <laughs> uh, and, uh, which is uh, very focused about care. And this is about uh, uh, working in communities, no? But this, uh, it is they are really talking and engaged and, 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 and having uh, conversations about radical care, no? And, and it's really that it starts within yourself, is listening to your body, is, is taking the time to say no, to, to take the time to rest, to take the time to sleep. And there are also plants and knowledge about plants that have been shared uh, among different circles to help, that can help you also to take care of, of, of yourself, no? And to be, uh, good with you because sometimes we are working so much we are so much in our minds that even our bodies are so tired that we cannot rest and there are some plans that can help also for it to you to to get into these states of, of resting no and then um, and i think that yeah i just wanted to share that also that it is is uh i think is kind of growing at least in aviala these practices of sharing knowledges 
for self-care among women because also historically, and this is also due to the patriarchal structures that we are living with, that women have been uh, received uh, this responsibility of uh, being the, the ones that care, that needs to care about everybody and forgetting themselves. That have happened a lot. Uh, so now there are these circles for sharing knowledges and, and this radical care, which is don't forget yourself because otherwise you won't be able, as Angus Somo was saying, not to join this other uh, collective work that also needs to be done. And we're also talking about the practice of grief and of mourning. It's really important that this can only be possible if, if we if we do this work of care, you know, like um, in most people who historically we've been part of movements, either they've been killed, they've lost all their best friends and they're like the last one standing. They spend time in, for example, they spend time in prison where they meet other women. And that's the only time when they rest and when they have self-awareness of who they are and, and, and who they can be. You cannot mourn if you are in a constant situation where you have to fight, where you have to fight, where you have to take revenge, where you make uh, uh, um, ill uh, against other, pe uh, other persons. This is not mourning. This is not grief. This is not letting go. That's why you don't want to be like in a Namibian desert looking back and then turning into a, a tree. You have to keep on moving forward. It doesn't mean that you forget about your past. But it's it's that's the work of mourning. There's so much you have to let go when you it's like it's like walking in fire. Mm -hmm. You just have to just get out of the fire, even if everything is burning down around you. It's that's that's how you do grief work. That's so so beautiful. Um given that nobody's asking a question, yes, I will look I would like to uh Also, the fall of uh, your ancestors' knowledge, your own knowledge. So, thank you. Really appreciate. I would like to share about you. This point we are talking about uh, mourning and grief. Uh, recently, there were uh, <coughs> an earthquake back home in Morocco, when actually the the death approached me like very close to me, and those like the whole things. Also, when you embody somehow like sorrow that's coming from the news because you are not there and you are far away in the diaspora life. And, and then the grief, like, like how the grief was embedded in you, the sorrow, this was like super uncomfortable. Because of us, because I was focusing on how can I grieve the people while ignoring the earth, the trees, the, the, the call of the rage of the earth, or like this, this call of change. And then um, I was like going somehow like some depression thing when I was like focusing on people dying only. I d I'm not meaning that <coughs> people, they can die, I don't care, but also how to see it as like a whole thing, that's the whole earth speaking as a human within the earth, animals within it, water as well. So I had to go to, to, to imagine mourning because also I feel like living here in, in the Netherlands, I have like the connection with mourning back home forgetting the songs of morning. And I love that, like, maybe being doing art or something is just being a window, being given the possibility to open a window and somehow to celebrate this, this morning. When you were talking about morning and the relationship with somehow like some toxic issue, like, I don't know if I can call it toxic, but some harsh things on us that's like, make distance from us in our self-love self, self -love or self-care, whatever. So also I think that um, mourning is also an opportunity to celebrate this rage, to celebrate this anger, to celebrate this sadness, and also to celebrate the change. And, and I think just like while working with soil and let the, the soil lead you, let the soil take your hands or whatever, like also like embodying or performing the, the, the construction and just like feel like th th that earth, or that's what's happened. It was distraction within you and without of you. And I'm like, and then I 
just like just please do this ritual that was just my imagination leading me to it and i like wallahi just like on one day or something i really feel like the release was there and i'm like girl like from now celebrate your fucking grief celebrate your fucking your fucking your beautiful rage uh, if i can call it like now but like also Something we were mentioning about like the uh, the, co the community, yeah. Uh, I think uh, like when you perform or you, when you like lead a ritual with other people, are you calling the people or are you like calling yourself to 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 the, the ritual? Like I don't know. Like you, we bring people and like when we bring people on a in space, what kind of relation? Who want to be engaged? Um, how my individual work can is it to influence other is it to say words is it to engage them is i'm like i have to go so quick toward my healing process so i like everyone let's go the healing time um so i'm just <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so so like i'm just like thinking about like also processing the grief because we like both talk, like all of you talking beautifully about like how grief is also connected to self-care and etc but like also I believe within my body that I'm more as more I'm doing the ancestral work, ancestral healing work. That's also my my work. Like I'm doing I'm doing the healing work. It's more getting worse and worse and worse. And I I know that it's not about like to go from now like from A to 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 B and to finish the the sadness whatever. So it's gonna get like circles. But also within myself, I'm like, okay, this time you fall. It's who just go and like also like the forgiveness within with the forgiveness to destroy what we can call perfection dealing with ourselves. Also, you were mentioning about time. It's like, okay, let yourself do it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's wrong, if it's like, okay, it's toxic a little bit, maybe it's fine, good. Um, so I'm just questioning these questions while listening to you and also doing my own practice. So, so yeah, thank you. Would you like to react? Um, anybody of you, Anna, Cristina, Ingesomo? Okay, oh, thank you. <laughs> it was really uh, wonderful to hear it. Um, I was um, on mind with some of the things that you comment about also have a moment for healing uh, uh, just yourself. And yeah, also I was um, thinking and experience with a chemo because also I and when I made these actions, I was um, I started chemo in 2018, and I finished the last chemo that I received. It was in, um, in bef 2021 in January. Um, so during that period of time, a lot of dynamics on my body changed, and also a lot of uh, it's. Uh, uh, ways how I work with my body and it makes me th perceive also the energy of, of 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 my body and also the things that are there because I uh, start very active um, on the streets <laughs> I, I was I just I feel so so good and I could do a lot of I love to run, <laughs> so I was running from one place to another, and in the streets, and and we were there, and and so when you had a kind of diagnostic, and you have to just uh, continue with a treatment that in in this case was um, it was another kind of chemo, like uh, it was in that uh, uh, something that I had to cover my skin, so I had to also be aware about the sun because um, it was uh, something that I, I had to cover my skin and and because it was a skin cancer uh, so a lot of things change and also um, the moments that I used to share with a lot of people also change mm -hmm. it makes me also realize that it's important the respect of the moment of if you can go if, if you have to uh, stay in, in in the house or uh, even if um uh, don't uh, 
because sometimes it's difficult even to follow the news you know so in the so th that that kind of things change and and also i realized that um with, with, with all these questions like okay there are moments when my body needs to just is stay rest um have a moment just for my own um well then <laughs> that's what i i do i, I really it helps me connect and uh, with different parts of me and also it's like a conversation that i have with friends with my family even if they are not present for me it's 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 it's, 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 a, it's a moment when I feel like I'm not alone. So it's, it's also like, like um, uh, yeah, I'm not outside with, with, uh, with these women that are so special for me, but I am with these um, and other bodies and also are connected with me and they're growing and I, I make them grow. Um, and yeah, there are also these moments when it's like, okay, I don't feel sick. I, I also, there are something that when you are in a, in a medical in institution, or oh, probably there are some people that, oh, you have cancer. It's like, oh, <laughs> they see you like a sick people, person. But sometimes like, no, I don't feel like that. Okay, there are moments when I prefer to just stay alone, but don't make me feel sick. <laughs> sometimes like, I just want that you listen. I just want that you just stay there and just, just, we can share just just a food and we can just walk or we can protest together <laughs> we can go to the streets and i think that um there are these kind of actions that also i saw it in a way that there yeah that i feel like i am i'm still there i have i i still have this this energy so it's um i think yeah there are the different kind of moments and I, I was also it's, it's like a complete uh, try to rediscover myself every time because also now I'm here and and, uh, and, and also and, and connected to Anna said about like okay we are here this is not a place where I used to be um, and also the, the dynamic outside is completely different that I used to live in, in Lima where I was in alert stress all the time but here is like, try to recognize also my body and also how I feel, because I'm not there. And when I came, a lot of protests start in December, November in Peru and even uh, continue in January. So it was also, I don't know, I, I feel kind of guilty. I could really recognize that on me. And I feel like sad because I wasn't there. I was no, I wasn't there. And I was thinking what I can do because I'm here. I'm in Maastricht. I was in Maastricht and everything feels so distant. And I feel so, I don't know, something is not good. So it took me time, I guess, try to understand and just have this moment, just let it go to because uh, that never happened to me before. I was always there. Even if I was in my house, I was there. I was um, visiting my friend. I was calling, just a video call or something, but I was there. But here it feels like, okay, I have to reconnect again and try to uh, understand what is happening with this, all these emotions, what happened with, this, with these wounds, and also parts of me that I thought that uh, are healed or sometimes yeah, there are, but it was it's another kind of lecture that I have to do with myself. Mm -hmm. And also how I feel with this collective, this, this group where I used to be part, mm -hmm. but now it's, it's, it's also try to understand me in that way and also be patient and, and respect also each other because we are bodies and we are gonna move constantly and we are gonna, we are like uh, organisms we are in, <coughs> in different in transformation, in constant transformation. Um, I think in that process also, how I understand my body in also in different places, this body that I don't perceive it as a body that is not is sick, it's not. Um, and also how can I feel also again that, uh, that, that power, because I think also celebration is important. <laughs> It's so important. We can have this moment like 
yeah, we are here and I'm still here and I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm doing it because we are sisters. We are, we are part of something and we are in this life and you have to enjoy it. And I think it's something that I'm continue learning and I always, I, I think I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm in this process to try to think, you know, how to connect, but at the same time, um, care and care of, of me. And because, um, yeah, many things are happening around uh, in the context of it, it. And I can feel it, perceive it, but I have, I also have the same time I have to take care of, of myself. Of course. Thank you very much, Christina, also for speaking. Thank you very much again to uh, to Christina for this last intervention, and of course for um, um, for everything that you have been sharing. Um, we need to move on with the program, but before going into that, I would like just to um, call again the title of uh, Anna's installation here about if we remain silent. I think that we have been having uh, have had sorry the opportunity of listening to three amazing artists that are not remaining silent about self-care, about um, embodying uh, that sort of self-care in the context of institutions that demand uh, some sort of, you know, of work or expect much more than what one can healthily do but also that very bravely and creatively and passionately have been speaking about how they express this in their different practices, in the different uh, projects. And this is something that I leave here as a possibility of learning to what extent listening to uh, people like them speaking about mourning, speaking about illnesses, speaking about um, honoring those who are before us, but nonetheless, uh, don't lose don't, without losing our life and our health, our bodies in that struggle. I think that is a very important learning for each of us in this particular context. Somebody said once to me that the West is the continent or the region of the world that is unable to speak about death, and actually have constantly been denying the possibility of mourning. So I think that. We have a lot of things to sense and think after w what we have been just listening to. So I really thank you for not remaining silent and speaking about each of the um, topics that you brought today and your emotions and your learnings. Thank you very much. And now I will give the floor for a statement that will be read right now in relation to our next film produced by Noor. But um, before that, let me give the floor to, um, yeah, I don't like it really, but okay. <laughs> no, Leanne. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for today. It's been very, very important to call, yeah, gather with you and listen to you. Um, Anna and Joram for making this happen. It's been a gift, humongous gift, uh, yeah, what you have done. And I am really, really thankful. And then for gathering all of these amazing people to share. It's been very, very important to think and be here and listen today and also listen of the humongous work you're doing to make uh, life because it's a, uh, yeah, with so much debt, this all has been stories, it's grieving, uh, but it's also about uh, sustaining life and making life and making live when, yeah, so it's very, very moving. Thank you. Um, my name is Aline. I'm the artistic director of Casco. Um, and I'm very happy to see you all here. Some have left, but uh, for those that uh, remain, it's uh, important that you also join us in this gathering. And the next uh, artwork uh, is uh, by a Palestinian artist, Noor Abed. Uh, Noor was 
not uh, able to join us here for the reasons that you may understand. There's brutal attacks being carried uh, in her homeland by the Israeli uh, yeah, colonial uh, forces and dealing with that and processing that, so much debt for so many decades, uh, she has decided to join us in and uh, through her film. And also taking this opportunity as a uh, casco, uh, I want to also say that we want to express solidarity with Palestinian people and with the Palestinian struggle. It's very, very important for us and it also connects with the, with the subject of the exhibition. So not to remain silent and to speak and to speak about what's happening because there's genocide happening and yes, so we are also very thankful for, for Noor to, to be here and uh, to give us also the opportunity to see Palestine through her eyes uh, as a filmmaker. Thank you. So the film will be projected, it lasts 20 minutes, I think so, and after that uh, we will have a closing led by Ibelice, so thank you for uh, staying with us.
I uh, will take the four microphones that I will borrow as a way to bring all the voices that were given today. <coughs> Even though the mic is under the chair. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you. And I will bring these voices to this vortex or some, you know, it as an altar to close and without feedback to close this afternoon, this day, this conversation, this symposium, this alchemical exchange for all of us. And what what a closure asks from the lineage where I have learned this practice is simply gratitude for what we received uh, gratitude to, to our bodies as well for taking in and gratitude to our ancestors for telling us everything they need to tell us. So I'm just going to close this. And if you want, you can listen to me or you can also practice in your own way how to think for this gathering today. OK?
为一体。Obrigada. Vai ter um nível. Take your time if you need to take your time. When you're sinking it in. 